Hello everyone and welcome to episode 13 of The Journeyman, a podcast dedicated to the work of overlooked and underrated filmmakers. On each episode we pick a director who we feel more or less fits that description and work our way chronologically through their entire filmography. My name is Michael Patterson, I'm here with my co-host Bobby Lowe. Follow us on Twitter at underscore journeyman and subscribe to us through SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes or YouTube. Uh, this episode is dedicated to Emil Orgelino, born 1943 and died in 1993, aged 50. Um, for the purpose of this focus, um, he made six feature films in chronological order. Uh, they are Dirty Dancing, 1987, Chances Are, 1989, Three Men and a Little Lady, 1990, Sister Act, 1992, The Nutcracker, 1993, and Gypsy, 1993. Before any of those, however, uh, Ardolino was known as an actor in off-Broadway productions, and uh, he also directed profiles of various dancers and various choreographers for PBS as part of the two successful series, Dance in America and Live from the Lincoln Center. Um, I think across those two series, he was nominated for 17 Emmys and won three, um, and then later directed a number of teleplays, including a 40-minute adaptation of Rumpelstiltskin for Shelley Duvall's Fairy Tale Theatre for Showtime, and the 70-minute Alice at the Palace in 1982 um, as part of Project Peacock, uh, NBC's early 80s slate of children's movies, uh, Alice at the Palace starring Meryl Streep. Um, both of those are available to watch online, for those of you who care. Um, now, the thing for which... Ordolino was best known prior to directing um, the six features we're going to cover on this episode was um, He Makes Me Feel Like Dancing, um, a documentary about ballet dancer Jacques D'Amboise, uh, for which he won the 1984 Academy Award uh, for Best Documentary. Um, but, and we've both seen this. Yeah. Um, we're not going to cover it like as part of the, you know, a full like full length journeyman segment. Um, but we did watch it because we felt like, you know, its notability was warranted a yeah. pass. Uh, a look, I, watched, I watched bits and pieces of those other two as well, the Alice at the Palace and uh, Rumpelstiltskin. Alice at um, the Palace is... It looked weird. It's very weird, yeah. It. it looks like community theatre. Mm. Um, and Meryl Streep, like, in a very, very energetic role. <laughs> like... <laughs> um, yeah, anyway... Uh, what did you think of He Makes Me Feel Like Dancing? Yeah, I liked it. I thought it was a, um, um, an overall... I hesitate to say sweet, um, because I'm not sure if the film itself is or if if, if Jacques D'Amboise needs or should be described as such, because it's basically about his um, training of kids, right, in New York City. Um, yeah. Of of various abilities, um, and it's and it's not like you know a tough dancing school. Um, it very he very much comes across as somebody who loves what he does, is very good at energizing, yeah, um, youths. Um, and <laughs> yeah, it's forty nine minutes. It's a it's a year long dance academy for kids of different ages. I'm not sure mm-hmm. exactly what the age range is, um, but it culminates in this big performance, but Mm -hmm. it's not just the kids that he's teaching. So like, there's a point where they're talking about how they over the years have had to expand the program. And for a while he tried to teach all the kids, but he eventually had to bring in other, um, teachers and and dancers to, um, handle the fact that they were taking on like a thousand kids every year. Um, I found it, I found it pretty interesting, uh, for the first half. And then the second half is highlights from their actual show. Um, which reminded me of, uh, when principal Skinner tells the parents in the Simpsons that the doors have been locked at the talent show so that they can't leave after <laughs> their kids have performed. Mm. So I was thinking, you know, imagine having to sit through this whole thing <laughs> just cause your kid is in one segment of it. Cause they're bringing like 30, 40, 50 kids on stage per, uh, musical number. Mm. Um, just to kind of get through the thousand that they have. Um, what do you, and, Ardel- you... and Ardelino lets it kind of play out. Obviously, the sequences are, are way, like much truncated. Um, sure. But yeah, I, I agree that the first half of this film is the more fascinating because it's there's something about like the 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 repetition of just training 
of any kind, but the physical repetition of, you know, learning choreographies and like synced timing mm-hmm. of of you know all these kids just like following his act, and he has this way of um, like associating each individual move with like a phrase. Um, which took me back to when I used to do drum lessons at school and uh, my uh, drums teacher, Mr. Wilson, would uh, like associate like quavers with like coffee, uh, a crotchet with tea and then like Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola coffee, lemonade tea. And we, I, would, I would learn certain rhythms with their verbal associations. Um, but he seems to be a, he seems to be a kind of a, um, an incredibly you know, decent chap. Do you, did you know anything about him before watching this? Just that, I mean, he's, it's, I know he was known primarily as a ballet dancer, but he had been in films as well. But no, I didn't know anything about Jacques D'Amboise's life or work um, before watching this and made me ask myself, do I, you know, is this, is this the kind of documentary that gives us an insight into him? Or into his process. Obviously, a documentary can do both. Um, I'd, say it, I'd say it does both. Yeah. Um, but it, he, he, you know, like I said, the first half of the documentary is about him, and the second half is about the show. Yeah. Uh, you know, like in the second half of the, of the film, it's mostly just him, like a few like sparse shots of him watching uh, the show and, you know, watching it approvingly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it was fine. It was okay. It's um, it's a sort of a time capsule as well. If mm. You know what I mean? Just in the way, because just to describe it a little for those for those who haven't seen it, um, it's primarily sort of observational verite style documentation of the dance lessons, accompanied by audio vox pops by the children or with the children, um, who are describing what they like about his process and we also get i think audio insights from him and his colleagues but uh, the kids themselves the, they're sort of the ways in which they articulate themselves verbally felt very like i can't imagine i mean kids are always precocious especially like kids who attend you know dance lessons at early ages mm-hmm. and stuff but it just seemed very like late 70s early 80s in the way they they were expressing themselves they were very articulate and self-aware weren't they Mm, absolutely yeah like yeah like breaking down what one of them breaks down what he um responds to Mm -hmm. in terms of like a teaching style and why certain other styles he doesn't respond well to and then he and then he maps that against what Jacques Danvoise does, yeah. and therefore justifies <laughs> or rationalizes the the reasons for enjoying his class, which is like that's like yeah, very aware of their own like fears and limitations, and you know, like even even thinking forward to uh, oh, if I quit now, I'd regret it in the future and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, it's like a cognitive reflexivity <laughs> that you'd expect yeah. from like a PhD student. <laughs> um, so I like that. I think the most out of everything. Um, because, yeah, you're never quite sure if, you know, you don't want to be watching, like, a hagiography, do you? Um, but at the same time, Dan Wars is, like, you know, nice nature uh, just sort of come through. All right, will we move on? Uh, what would you give this out of ten? Um, seven, I like. I'll give, give it a six, because the second half of it was a little bit uh, trying doesn't bode well for the rest of the of the episode. I'm dying to know what you think about these films. So. Um, and then, so, uh, as I said, he won, that was 1983, that film. He won the Academy Award for it in 1984. But 1984 began for Ardolino, um with directing Good Morning, Mr. Orwell. Um, at, at, like, a, it was the first, it's described as the first international satellite installation, quote-unquote, by Nam June Pike, um, who's often credited uh, with inventing video art. Um, have you seen this? I'm guessing no. not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like um, 
an event that took place on New Year's Day 1984 uh, linked WNET TV in New York and the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Um, I'm reading off Wikipedia here, if, if you couldn't already tell. Um, via satellite, as well as hooking up with broadcasters in Germany and South Korea. Um, and it gained, garnered 25 million viewers worldwide. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a bit of an obscure um, work. It looks very experimental, texturally, conceptually, and otherwise. Um, and I would like to see it, if only to map it against the much more conventional stuff that Arduino came to direct. So, which brings us to um, 1987's Dirty Dancing. What do you think you're doing? You, you're in trouble, you talk to me. I'll take care of it. You should have come to me in the first place. Forget it, Johnny. I'm not taking what's left of your salary. Penny, that's my business. And besides, it wouldn't be enough. <laughs> oh, God, it's hopeless. Don't say that. There's got to be a way to work it out. Baby? Is that your name? Well, you know what, baby? You don't know shit about my problems. I told her. Jesus, Billy, now she's going to run and tell her little management boyfriend and we all get fired. Why not Skywriter? Penny got knocked up by Robbie the Creep. Robbie? Look, we no, no, baby, baby. One of the counselors knows a doctor, a real MD, just traveling to New Pulse for one day next week. We can get him an appointment, but it costs $250. But if it's Robbie, there's no problem. I know he has the money. I'm sure if you tell him... He knows. Go back to your playpen. Baby. Okay, so Dirty Dancing, written by Eleanor Bergstein, um and produced by Linda Gottlieb for Great American Films and Limited Partnership and distributed by Vestron Pictures, was released in the U.S. in August of 1987, in the U.K. in October of 87, and in Ireland in November of 87. Uh, it grossed $213 million from its $6 million production budget, and uh, it's kind of amazing that there was never a direct sequel to it. Mm. Um Okay, so the plot here. In the summer of 1963, 17-year-old Frances Baby Houseman, played by Jennifer Grey, is vacationing with her affluent family at Kellerman's Resort in the Catskills before setting off to join the Peace Corps. While there, Baby develops an attraction to Johnny, played by Patrick Swayze, the resort's working-class dance instructor. Baby discovers that Johnny's dance partner, Penny, is pregnant by Robbie, one of the Houseman's waiters. When Robbie refuses to help Penny, Baby borrows money from her father to pay for Penny's illegal abortion without revealing what the money is for. At first, Penny refuses an abortion as it would mean she and Johnny missing a performance at a neighboring resort, costing them the season's salary. Baby volunteers to stand in for Penny, and during her dance sessions with Johnny, they develop a romantic attraction. Baby's father forbids her from seeing Johnny, but she's determined to help him perform the last big dance of the summer. Um, so I had never seen this film before, and when I saw Jennifer Grey at the beginning of the film, I was like, oh wait, I thought... I thought she was in like flash dance or something like that. And I realized mm -hmm. that I, I just like all these eighties dance movies just all get mixed up in my head. Cause I haven't seen any of them. So like flash dance and, uh, what's that other one? Uh, footloose, footloose. Yeah. And, and dirty dancing. They're all kind of just like mixed up together in my head. Um, you had seen it before though. This is your favorite film of all time, isn't it? Well, we'll come to the, <laughs> the cloaked snark of that, uh, <laughs> comment. But uh, I had seen it before. I have a sister six years my senior, and so it was a kind of a, a... Like another film on this episode, which we'll get to, was very prominent in my early years. And then actually I'd seen it as recently. I rewatched it last August uh, with a friend. Um, we had a we had a, a, a self-curated double bill of that, of this film and Grease. Okay. And... Um, you know, obviously, Greece was made ten years previous to this film. It's they're very, very, very different films, but there's a massive overlap in terms of like people who like that film might like this film, etc., and so on. Um, and so, yeah, I liked it a great deal last year. Um, it was the first time I'd seen it for many, many years, um, and watched it 
liked it a great deal. And I liked it even more this time around, watching it in the context of, um, you know, getting to grips with Emil Ordolino's output as a director. Coming back to your uh, the, the, the snark with which you cloak that comment about it being my favourite of a film, is there a tendency here, do you think, and I know you were just joking, by the way, but is there a tendency here for guys or dudes, cinephiles or otherwise, to like this film, quote unquote, ironically, um, and to sort of formulate their love of it or liking of it as a form of uh, apologia? Uh, I don't know. Because um... it's, you know, it's marketed and known and referenced as you know, uh, a woman's picture. Sure, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, and <laughs> watching it with a sort of critical eye, um, <laughs> watching it with a critical eye, um, it, it it sort of, I was surprised by how successful and economic the film is in its um, depiction of um, basically a summer romance from the female's vantage point i'm just laughing um, i'm just sorry i'm just laughing because uh <laughs> all the way through the movie i was thinking man this would be a great setting and premise for a slasher movie <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah um, indeed, indeed it would really have uh like a lot of just just the whole yeah the whole um the kellerman's resort and so on uh yeah, and like you know, uh, teenage promiscuity. Sure, and, like it, that's, yeah. it's like I was I was looking at it kind of in in those kind of generic terms, like of, you know, uh, <clears throat> it, it 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 does seem to take like these eighties um, themes, like you've got the summer camp, you've got the training montage, you've got like this teen melodrama, you've got this kind of uh, never fully articulated but still sort of there snobs versus slobs kind of theme as well, or the, the class conflict yeah. at the at the resort. And it yeah. just seems to be taking, like, this is 87, so a lot of this stuff comes from the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, mm. And it does seem to be, because, like, those slasher films from the early 80s were tapping into the same thing. Like, they obviously had that horror overlay or, or focus, but there is that thing, like, the summer hijinks, like, away from the parents and, like, you know, romantic misadventures and yeah, uh, first love and all that kind of stuff is, is there in those movies as well. So it's a, kind of an odd, maybe an odd comparison, but <clears throat> there is a kind of... A, um, the similar kind of DNA in the in those genres because yeah, of, because of who they're yeah. appealing to, they're who Absolutely. their audiences are. Yeah, um, and um, you know I've I've never been to the Catskills, uh, Kellerman's Resort. I, I, it wasn't filmed there, I believe. Uh, I think it was filmed in a combination of lakes in North Carolina and Pembroke, Virginia, because of the fact that the real life resorts to which this film is sort of referring, depicting, had, had since been closed down um, because but, of all the murders. Because of all the murders there, the serial killers uh, <laughs> maximizing their opportunity to yeah. Uh, yeah, prowl these uh, resorts. No, but my understanding is Bergstein's script is heavily autobiographical okay. um, and draws upon her the time that she spent as you know um, a teenager with her family um, in these kinds of spaces. And uh, as I said, I've never been to the Catskills and I've never been to either North Carolina or Virginia, but there's a certain sort of innate beauty to this landscape, um, which I think the film really sort of captures, again, very economically. Um, but the film also digs beneath um, that beauty. Um, so obviously it doesn't go down the horror route as you wanted it to, but <laughs> there are nevertheless very, very serious things uh, discussed here that come to the fore, right. um, such as, uh, you know, a life-threatening abortion, um, such as the implicit violence of class. And actually one thing that I hadn't really noticed before, even though it's integral to the actual premise of the film, is how class is foregrounded as the primary mode or prism through which someone comes of age, basically. Um, and I hadn't really gotten that from previous viewings of, mm. of how sort of prevalent that is. Yeah. Actually, one of the things that, I, like I said, I, I mix up all these movies because I haven't seen them before, but uh, I didn't realize that this was set in the 60s. I thought it was set in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, I was kind of... I enjoyed the way that it's sort of presented as um, 
like as being about the origins of these dance styles mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. the the dirty dancing thing like they have these the, the the dance lessons that they give and the the dance performances that they do officially at the resort are kind of more classical uh than yeah. the marimbe and all, whatever the hell uh and they have these private the the dance instructors have this these private parties which you know are like the the, the dirty dancing style stuff uh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize that, so I didn't realize that it would kind of falls in, also falls into the category. I just listed off all those different, you know, eighties uh, teen movie tropes, mm-hmm. but it also falls into the category of the nostalgia film. It does um, not for the fifties, but you know, it's a similar kind of like it's only nineteen sixty three. So it does, but it's also weird in its uh, anachronistic mix of nineteen sixty. I mean, the soundtrack is great. You know, you've got all those like Phil Spector songs, Frankie Valley there. You've got, but then you've also got like so primarily like early sixties music, uh, and then you've got like. I've had the time of my life by mm. Bill Medley and Jennifer Warnes. You've got Hungry Eyes by Eric Carmen, which were made or composed for this film, right? Oh, really? And then really? You've got, yeah. And then you've got weirdly like Love Man by um, Otis Redding, which was one of I think his posthumously uh, a track from his posthumously released album from 1969. So even that's like anachronistic. Um, and so you've got this weird mix of period songs and then more sort of modern day needle drops, which somehow I think have helped to encapsulate this film's lasting, enduring qualities um, of, you know, simultaneously capturing a certain mood, like a period mood, while also tapping into the current sort of late 80s, mid 80s sort of zeitgeist or whatever, if I may speak in extremely broad terms. Uh, and as a result of that, it's helped to sort of can- can- canonize this film um, in a way that Flashdance and Footloose ha- weren't or haven't been. Sure. Okay. Uh, what do you make of all the many, many, many political references throughout it? Like, there is a lot referenced. Like, so they reference, uh, like, like we said, Baby is on the cusp of going to join the Peace Corps, and she says she's mm-hmm. going to be doing famine relief work in Southeast Asia. And her dad, who's a, a doctor, says, you know, it's like she's going to save the world or whatever. There's a mm-hmm. reference to the Freedom Riders. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a reference to the, in the narration, there's a reference to the impending assassination of JFK. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a reference to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, there's a question, like her her sister Lisa asks her dad about what he thinks about the domino theory, which is, you know, the idea that once Vietnam falls, China's next and blah, 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 whatever. Uh, or not, sorry, not China, but, but uh, yeah, actually she does ask, like, once once Vietnam falls, is China next? Um, China was already communist at the time, though. Mm. Not sure what, anyway. Uh, what's that about? Like it's just it's it's is it is it there just to underpin or highlight the class theme? Because it's 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 maybe it's, it's very it's very political in the in the narrow sense. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe also to in very subtle ways um, highlight the sort of naive perspective of uh, an incredibly affluent or or a teenager of an, an incredibly affluent, uh, overwhelmingly white milieu as well. Um, which I think is something that we might be coming back to again and again with Ardolino's films, um, at least his, his first f- four features, um, or first three. Um, it is it is strange, um, because nothing comes of it beyond, as you said, sort of underpinning the very specific class conflicts that are depicted within the film. Um, so you've mentioned the fact that Johnny is the working class dance uh, choreographer, but then you've also got Robbie, um, who is responsible for Penny's um, pregnancy, and he he is taken to uh, very positively by um, Baby's dad because he is attending Yale um, as a medical student or is about to, yeah. and um, yeah, and <laughs> there's that weird moment later because so Baby's dad is going to give Robbie like a ton of money (laughs) um, as a result of this. But then later on, and again, this is something that I'll probably be coming back to again in other films by Ardolino, but you've got that sort of very easy or neat um, narrative resolution at the end uh, (laughs) when he realizes Robbie... He doesn't, know, he, doesn't, he doesn't realize that Robbie says it. Yeah, Robbie, <laughs> Robbie, Robbie actually, actually says it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm, and I'm, then he, I'm the one thanks for... What does he say? He says he thanks him or something for... for uh... Yeah, for paying for the abortion, basically, for supporting Penny, right? Right, right, yeah. yeah. 
And up to that point, uh, Baby's father, who has been on, he's been under the assumption that it was Johnny, um, who had knocked the knocked the girl up and whatever, and wasn't like you know doing the right thing. Yeah, and also that he was kind of then moving on to his his own daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so yeah, he snatches the money back, uh, which and it's a very sort of but, easy way to resolve that. Hmm. So it's it, like the he the the doctor uh, he makes an assumption about. Um, he makes an assumption about Johnny, but it's not really an assumption made on the basis of Johnny's class background. It's an assumption made on the, it's an assumption that the baby also made that he and Penny are uh, together, that they're a couple because of the intimate nature of their dirty dancing, right? Yeah. Right at the at the sort of uh, so as you said, the illicit party that they're at. So it's kind of a reasonable assumption to make, but isn't it informed on some level by class? Possibly, maybe somewhere down the line. Somewhere down the know. line, maybe, but it's not. It, it's not a very strong for for all of the emphasis that the film puts on class. Like it, you can see, like like you said, a neat resolution. The once once it's revealed to him, like once he has that piece of information, mm. there's no there doesn't seem to be any residual class prejudice. Mm. Although he does then ultimately he does try to get up and stop her dancing with him, I suppose afterwards, and his wife says very sternly, "Sit down." Nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> what do you make? Okay, so, uh, you know, if I may move on a little yeah. bit from that, um, what do you make of Swayze? He's very good. I mean, if I remember, am I remembering correctly that you said that this is your favorite Patrick Swayze performance when I said that yes. my favorite was Point Break? Yes. Okay. Have you seen Roadhouse? No. Oh, okay. Uh, he, yeah, he's really, he's really good in it. Um, everybody's good in it, but... Um, what I was a little bit disappointed in with it is I was very into, like, you know, we get to this new place and uh, I was thinking, you know, this would be a great setting for a slasher movie and people start, ex like, we, we kind of explore the new sort of environs with these characters because they, like, I don't think she had been there before. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, um, and we meet we meet all the new people and stuff and it's a very uh, kind of involving way to start the film. Mm -hmm. um, and then we get this build up to this dance that she has to like learn the dance. And like, we get this like, tr like eighties training montage, yeah. but then it's over really quickly. And that structure evaporates and it settles into this, uh, romantic melodrama mode mm -hmm. and leaves the kind of the, the sports movie structure that it had teased that behind. And that threw me a little bit. And I was a little bit let down by that. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it's 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 not a film about whether or not she's going to pull it off. Yeah, that's, there is an element. That's of what that. I that's what I thought that it was though, because you know, the, like yeah. the training montage where they're like balancing on the log, sure. and he's you know all sure. that kind of stuff. And um, actually, it's weird. Probably in chime with what you've just said, I always misremember that, and I always forget how early it happens because it's kind of the you know that iconic sequence of them training. You always, I always forget and assume. Hmm. Uh, that it happens late, much later in the film, but you're right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's only uh, about halfway through. We we, yeah. we move into we move into uh, the romantic melodrama. I don't have a, I don't have a problem with it though because once it does settle into that um, other mode, it's it's when you know the, the characters like basically do literally settle down, and we get to find out more about you know Johnny, um, and he gets to voice his own anxieties and whatever else, uh, like to uh, baby. Um, and yeah, I don't mind, I don't mind it actually. What do you make of the musical sequence at the end where everybody starts dancing in sync? Where yeah, it, act, I, it actually, I, yeah. like it's, it's, it's really good, but it's strange, right? Because it's, it's almost breaking the fourth wall. That's what I mean. Um, like it's not, when I say musical, I mean like this is a music movie. It's a music dance movie, yeah. but it's not a musical. But yeah. there's that moment where everybody inexplicably, uh, like fantastically starts to dance in unison together with, with, uh, Johnny. Yeah, um, which 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 they do at the end of uh, Greece as well, but obviously that has Greece been is a musical throughout. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I love it. I mean, it, it it is a change. It is a it, it is a shift in register, mm. but it's it, it feels earned, or it feels like the, mm. the the skill with which the shift takes place um, is sort of transportive. Okay, um, and and in general, I mean, the dance Swazia is just. He is so sexy in this film. Honestly. <laughs> like he is, though he is like that. 
Like, <laughs> it's such a joy watching him, like, dancing with Penny in that, like, party scene where Baby's helped, what's his name, with the watermelons, and that's how she's there. And, you know, he's, Ardolino's doing that short reverse shot thing of, like, just cutting back to Jennifer Grey, just, like, amazingly curious and intrigued by this guy's presence. And, um, and like, you know, when he, he's, like, sort of looking at her in a sort of daring way, like, you know, weighing her up, but also, like, why are you here? What What's your purpose? All the way through the dancing. And, you know, Ardolino lets it play out. Like, we, we stay in that dance or in that room for quite a while. Uh, yeah, and I think it's great. Okay. Uh, one last thing. Uh, Wayne Knight is so funny in this. I mean, he's, he's barely in it, but he's, like, he just has such a distinctive laugh. Um, yeah. Anyway, okay, yeah. So, uh, you're writing for this? Well, it was an eight last year when I saw it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna commit to a nine. Wow. And yours? A six? Fuck off. (laughs) I feel like this is a, this is, this is a taste thing for you, right? It's like a preference, like, because you haven't really mounted any sort of heavy criticisms against the film, and yet... Yeah, sure. I could, of I course, could it is. I, mean, this. I could anticipate. I could anticipate this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it is. It's. Uh, I like I said the second the second half of the movie when it turns into a romantic melodrama. Oh, by the way, one really I, I actually would have liked more comedy because one of, one moment that really made me laugh was when she goes to talk to Robbie, and he says some people matter and some people don't, and then he produces this dog eared copy of the Fountainhead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and hands it to right. her and says, "Make sure you give it back to me because I got notes in the margins." <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. Uh, a little bit more of that maybe would have spiced up the second half of it for me, but uh, mm. yeah, it was. Yeah, I enjoyed it, but I, I wouldn't really. I wasn't wouldn't get too excited over it. So for me, it's a six. Okay, so okay. moving on to his second film, 1989's Chances Are. I have to talk to you. Get, get, get off me! I'll make you promise to listen to what I have to say. Okay. Okay. Don't break that. It was father's. No, no. Good night. Good night. You win. Good night. Just relax. I'll leave. I'm sorry, but this is important. I had a pair of diamond earrings with me the day I died. They were for you, for our anniversary. How do you know about those? I bought them for Mr. Zeller back. How do you think I know? I know everything about you, darling. I know that you love peanut butter and rhubarb and cats with yellow eyes. You're a psychic. I want to show Shirley McLean's kooks a spoon bender. Oh, you love Johnny Mathis. Get out of here! I hate flat Before feet. I scream so loud that everybody in the neighborhood shows up and I have you arrested for impersonating a person. And I know you did the Watusi before Lucy Baines, remember? Remember this? <laughs> Good night. Chances Are was written by Perry Hauser and Randy Hauser and produced by Mike Lobel for TriStar Pictures and Lobel Bergman produ- Productions, uh, distributed by TriStar Pictures, uh, released March 10th, 1989. I have the date down here. Um, and it made a domestic gross of just over, uh, just more than 16 million against a budget of 16 million. Don't have international figures for that. Um, So the synopsis here is, um, a man's love for his pregnant wife, Corrine Jeffries, played by Sybil Shepard, is interrupted when a car accident sends him to heaven. That's one way of putting it. Um, He is reincarnated, however, and two decades later, he is a writer named Alex Finch, played by Robert Downey Jr., but when Alex starts dating Miranda Jeffries, Mary Stewart Masterson, his all grown up daughter from his previous life, he remembers his love for Corrine. This spells trouble for his past life best friend, Philip Train, played by Ryan O'Neill, who is now pursuing Corrine. I hadn't seen this before. I believe you had. I saw it when I was a kid, and it was actually the of the six films on this episode, it was the one I was most excited to watch. Uh even taking into account the ones I hadn't seen before because sure. I've actually had it on my like to rewatch list for a long time. Um, right. And I remembered really enjoying it. Robert Downey Jr. is so sexy in this movie. Shut <laughs> up, man. Shut up. 
Um, I I actually didn't particularly like it though. Did you? Um, I liked it. I w- I would say I like it. Um, it's it's one of those. Um, I imagine research papers have been written about this film. Uh, maybe in the context. Um, of uh, or maybe alongside other films discussing it in like psychoanalytical terms like mm-hmm. it lends itself to like you know the, the sort of cliched Freudian readings um, like it's very Back to the Future yeah it reminds um, me of the Oedipal stuff in Back to the Future yeah and it's one of those that plays out a light premise that nevertheless has uh, sort of heavy implications um, and I also wouldn't be surprised if more sort of journalistic think, piece, think pieces um, have revisited this um you know, to decry its sort of problematic gender politics or whatever else, um, which I'm sure you had problems with. Mm. Uh, but yeah, no, I liked it. It's, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's um, like Alex and, Alex and Kareen's chemistry. So the chemistry between Sybil Shepard and Robert Downey Jr. It's kind of hot, no? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. Um... <laughs> and, and, and even more than that, I couldn't. So when I was thinking, okay, this is hot, but I'm not sure if it's because of the chemistry of the characters or because of the premise. And I couldn't work out if it was hot because it was Alex and Kareen or if it was because Alex was a reincarnation of Louis and Kareen. I can't wait to hear your horny take on Sister Act. <laughs> God, what's gone? What's going on with me today? Seriously. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, okay, so, um, the first thing is, uh, this is a romantic comedy, high concept romantic comedy, um, Mm -hmm. that you mentioned Back to the Future, which is not a rom-com, but, you know, it has a similar, uh, sort of subplot about, uh, Mm -hmm. Marty's mom's attraction to Marty. Um, but in, in this one, this, it kind of reminds me of, um, Forever Young, the, the, uh, Steve Miner film with Mel Gibson and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, mm-hmm. But this is not very funny, is it? All of that stuff when Alex is realizing early on that this is, oh, wait, hold on, this is like my former wife. And, he, you know, he, he's yeah. sort of anticipating th- certain things to be in the draw. Right, he's having his weird 20, kind of 20 years after. Yeah. yeah. Um, it actually reminded me a little bit of. This might be a spoiler alert for a, for something else for another film or TV series, but it did remind me a little bit of Twin Peaks season three, particularly the finale of Twin Peaks season three, um, when Alex arrives at his former home. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, sure. I and there's it, yeah. that we had half recognition thing of like, oh, what year is this? Um, mm. um, yeah, I, is it funny? I mean, it, it has a sort of sort of like touch to what are sort of emotionally complicated things so for instance in the very first scene when Louis and Corrine are going to get married and Louis's best man Philip says you know Louis I need to tell you something I'm in love with Corrine and Louis says I know yeah <laughs> and like obviously that's like setting up okay the, the rest of the film uh, because in in the 20 years later you know, yeah, it's twenty twenty three years later, so he he dies in years, he dies in nineteen sixty four, which means the movie is mm-hmm. set in eighty seven. Yeah. Uh, so, and and her, um, Corinne is still like almost like psychotically hung up on uh, on on Louis, um, where she like yeah. leaves. She has a picture of him beside her bed, and she she still feeds him. She like cooks food for him, and she has a like a some sort of like yeah. chocolate biscuit kind of thing that she leaves beside his picture before she goes to sleep and stuff. Um, and it's, it isn't funny and it's, it doesn't seem particularly interested in exploring like the implications of its premise either. And that goes for the, the fantasy premise as well, where mm-hmm. the sequence that you mentioned where, uh, Alex is realizing like Louis's memory, Louis's memories are coming back to Alex. And the reason is that when he, uh, he he is in heaven. He has to. Ch- is, is, is it heaven he's in? See, that's the thing. It's well, like he's in some sort of, weird some sort of waiting room. It, right? It's very kind of like pearly gates, right? It's, a, it's like mm-hmm. they're walking around on the clouds and stuff like that. But you know, reincarnation is not part of Christian uh, mm-hmm. theology, so it, it's not heaven because they're not staying there. Uh, so he's he's going, but he gets to choose which um, 
there's, you know, he, he gets a choice of babies who are just about to be born and his soul mm-hmm. will be, uh, reincarnated into one of those babies. And he picks a baby in, uh, somewhere he, he insists that it has to be somewhere on the East coast of the U S and he, once, once that's agreed, he just kind of runs away and strips off all his clothes and runs away into the kind of, into the mist. But he, he runs away before he gets his inoculation, which is this orange, uh, um, substance that removes their, the memories of their past life. Yeah. So he, that's why his memories start to come back to him. But like when that's happening, I'm just thinking like, cause they're like, Alex is not Louis, mm. right? Alex has mm. whatever, 23 years of a life in which he didn't have any memories, uh, that weren't his own. And then suddenly he starts to have these memories. And does that mean that Louis is just like suddenly emerging and annihilating Alex? Like what's happening? Yeah. Cause it's a, it it's is. a tricky it's, it's kind of underwritten. Yeah. Under, underwritten or under conceived. Like it's just, it just seems like, you know, so that for me it was kind of this, okay, the comedy eh, and the premise doesn't really satisfy as, um, you know, kind of speculative fiction or, or fantasy. Um, Would, yeah. And then I, I also have two notes here <laughs> taken at different points throughout the movie, uh, related to like, where the hell did the crime story go? Because there's a crime thing at the beginning yeah. where he's, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. he's a lawyer and he's got like this, uh, this like mobster guy on trial and, and the judge refuses to admit a piece of evidence and, then he gets tipped off that the, the, he needs to go to this place by this lake and he goes there and he witnesses, uh, the judge receiving a bribe to keep that particular piece of evidence, uh, to keep it in, 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 in it, to keep it inadmissible. And sure. that just, I, when I was watching it, cause like I said, I saw it when I was a kid and I didn't remember the, the details of it, but I was like, oh, he's going to get killed by the mob. That's yeah. how he dies. And then he just gets randomly hit by a car, right? Yeah, <laughs> Crossing the road yeah. to go to dinner with Corrine. Then the crime story just goes away for the whole movie until eventually he's, he goes to, cause, um, Corrine and Louis's daughter, cause Corrine is pregnant when Louis dies, mm-hmm. uh, is also a lawyer. And so he, like Alex goes to, to the courtroom to talk to Miranda mm-hmm. and sees the judge. And then Louis's memories come back about that weird meeting and not, but it's just like, <laughs> it's just there. It's just there. Well, like... another reason why it doesn't really make sense. It's disappearance is because of the fact that, um, Louis originally, um, gleaned evidence against the judge as a result of Philip's tip off his pal. Yeah. And Philip's still there 23 years later. So he's known about yeah, this yeah. all along. Um, and hasn't really acted upon it. Like he, he has the evidence. He hasn't acted. He's a journalist. He, he does. Yeah. He's a journalist. Yeah. And like, and then Philip, Right, so <laughs> you and you, the thing is, here's the thing, right? And we're, we're going to talk about this in relation to the next movie as well. It's like the the comic premise, right? You have this premise where you've got you've got a love quadrangle, right? You've got four mm-hmm. characters and they're all in love with each other. Philip is in love with Corinne. Uh, Alex slash Louis is in love with Corinne. Uh, mm-hmm. Corinne is in love with Louis, but not Alex. And Miranda is in love with Alex. And it's like it's it's potentially a strong comic premise, but it just it feels wasted. You know, it just, it doesn't like, there are a couple of, um, like there's a scene where Philip leaves the house and then comes back cause he's forgotten something and sees Alex slash Louis with Corinne, uh, undressing. And yeah. it's like, that's kind of where you would think that premise would go would be like sort sort of, and, and there's obviously the, the, the Oedipal stuff with Alex and Miranda, uh, when she's making advances toward him and he's trying to kind of gently rebuff her because of, you know, the fact that he now realizes that he's at least in part, uh, her father. But you see, like, that's the thing about the premise. It's not just like a pedantic thing. It's like, you have to understand what the relationship between Alex and Louis is because Alex is not Louis and Alex has no reason to feel, you know what I mean? Like there's a kind of a split personality sort of thing going on that isn't Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. acknowledged seemingly. Um, Mm -hmm. and you have that. And then, there's a couple of jokes, age related jokes, like where it's like, it's way past your bedtime. He says to, to Miranda, yeah. uh, and he, you know, and, and Corinne says, uh, I'm old enough to be your mother. Now go to your room. 
you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, there just doesn't my seem favorite, to be enough of any of it. My favourite joke of that ilk is when uh, they go on, like, a, a day out, um, Alex and, and Corinne, and uh, he buys a, they buy hot dogs. And uh, she, Alex walks off and she says to the, the guy at the kiosk, oh, how much is it? And he says, oh, your son already paid. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it's so funny this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do what do you make of Corinne discovering? Oh, okay. So this, I'll preface this question. I read Alex as, and I I agree with everything you're saying. It's it's under conceived or weird, but Alex is I think meant to be this sort of disruptive, but ultimately sort of corrective force. Yeah, uh, and in that sense, reminded me a little bit of um, Terence Stamp in the Pasolini film Tiarima. I was just about to mention um, Tiarima. Yeah. But this is—it's weird because this is distinct, distinctly not European mm-hmm. in its in its need to wrap things up in such a way that, ostensibly at least, uh, decomplicates its family unit or romantic entanglements, all the thing that you've just, all the stuff that you've just mentioned. And it decomplicates it with, like, you know, the juice ex machina of, of wiping Alex's memory again. So, like, this guy who, this bureaucrat in heaven or wherever, wherever it is, mm-hmm. um, who was meant to inject him with the, the memory wiping yeah. substance, then just reappears at the end yeah, after yeah, Alex yeah. has fallen down some stairs um, and wiping Alex's memory of having been Louis. So I say it ostensibly because Corinne and Philip are always going to be aware of his former existence anyway. Right. Right, even though he's not, and so uh, my question was going to be, what do you make of Corinne discovering a dormant love for Philip? Well, let me just answer the first part of that question because mm. I also f- noticed the exact same thing, and it it means that even though Alex has no memory of being Louis, and Louis has Louis ceased to exist now. Did that guy inoculating mm. Louis kill Louis? Because there's mm. no indication that Louis is going anywhere else. Like his soul is still in, like they have the same soul, so. Mm. There doesn't in this in this in the cosmology of this film there doesn't seem to be a heaven or an afterlife. It seems to be mm. reincarnation is the the kind of the destiny of the soul mm. is is to be endlessly reincarnated. Um, so in this case, the guy comes in and it's the implication is kind of dark, isn't it? Like he he's destroying Louis. Louis is, Louis is ceasing to mm. exist in in terms of his you know his uh, consciousness or or his memories um, and his personality, and it's just Alex that's left. But yeah, so Corinne and Philip are going to always know, and there's always going to be this issue of, it's not like they understand the cosmology of it, yeah. you know, and they're going <laughs> to, yeah, so he's going to be with their with her daughter. It's, it is, there's an incestuous thing going on that's, again, potentially kind of interesting in a, in a like, maybe darkly comic way, but it's just not, sure. it's like the film is just, it's like the writers just don't know, they're just not aware of it. Um, and in, in terms of the second thing, yeah, all of a sudden, like, she discovers that, I mean, like, she discovers that Philip Philip has basically been like her surrogate husband and surrogate father to Miranda for twenty three years, and then he tells her he finally plucks up the courage to tell her that he loves her, that he's always he's always loved her, and she just goes, oh yeah, okay, I'm over Louis now. Uh, all I needed to do was like have some sort of weird interaction with him in another body, and that made me realize yeah. oh, I'm over him. Uh, yeah, it sort of provides a sort of a... It's just pat, isn't it? Yeah. For, yeah, and yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it, it it very it too neatly decomplicates what is a premise that makes a point of its entanglements. Um, what, what do you so think of... I'm, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask, so I'm guessing you would... And and you could probably envisage here a much more sort of mournful, haunting, disturbing yeah. film being, you know, um, built around this premise. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, something that should be, you know, kind of moving and sad. That's and, the other thing. That's that's and, kind of it. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's neither one thing nor the other. It's neither funny nor poignant. Mm. Um, and it's so. What do you make of um, Downey's performance? Okay, I I mean I liked it. Did you not find his uh, his <laughs> the, the grin that he has plastered all over his face for most of it kind of t- smug and creepy. <laughs> <laughs> is it creepy because of the premise, or mm, he just seems to be a bit? Of a, he I just seems to be a bit of a creeper. Like the the, the when when I find uh, Philip a bit creepy. Philip, yeah, sure, okay, I can see that as well. There's a scene where Corinne leaves the house and and Alex leans out the front door and watches her leave, and as she turns, he kind of ducks back in, and it's like he has this creepy yeah. grin on his face. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
Um, I'm not the world, I mean, not the world's I, I, biggest Robert Downey Jr. fan, anyway, though. Uh, but this is before he mm-hmm. most of his his trademark mannerisms started to dominate his uh, performance. Sure, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, uh, I haven't, I can't remember seeing another early Robert Downey Jr. performance. Um, so it was it was interesting to sort of watch him and map his yeah early phase mannerisms here against what we now have, you know, as like fucking Iron Man and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, and what do you make of like Sybil Shepherd's performance as Corinne? I think she's the, probably the strongest thing in the movie. Yeah, uh, but I, she barely aged in twenty three years. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they don't even make an effort no, with that, actually. I mean, not as Philip. Nor as Philip. I mean, yeah, it's just like yeah, whatever. Twenty three years, but they're exactly the same people. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna go with a five here. Okay, that's a lot higher than I expected, given your problems with it. I'm going to go for a six, because okay. um, I did ultimately like it, but there are serious issues. Um, okay. And I think, yeah, it's just... A, I think the the one thing that, for me, is is the biggest flaw is the, the tone. It's like they don't really know what to do with yeah. the premise. And, like I said, yeah. it, falls, it falls in between being, uh, you know, a comedy and, like, a, like you said, a haunting, poignant... Mm. Uh, fantasy drama um, okay let's move on to his third film uh, Three Men and a Little Lady uh, Sylvia there's no more milk I'm getting married don't overreact I can get some milk Jack I think she's serious you serious? I'm very serious you're getting married? yes to someone specific? no to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir boy we spent all night at it and couldn't come up with squat what do you mean you spent all night at it? Uh, never mind. Who is he? Edward. Yes. Oh, but sweetheart, come on. He's a director. Why him? Because he asked me. And because I love him. I've got so much to do. You see, we're being married in England. When? As soon as possible. Edward's directing a production of Midsummer Night's Dream at the National, and I'll be doing it with him. Oh, is there anything in it for me? Jack, come on. Thanks. Aren't you happy for me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course we are. Of course. Thrilled. How many times does a lady get married, huh? Yeah, well, mm. two or three times the most? No, just once for me, thank you. Where are you going to live? London. London, England? No, London, New Jersey. And Mary? Taking Mary with me. Okay, so Three Men and a Little Lady, written by Charlie Peters and based on the 1985 French film Trois Hommes et un Coffin by uh, Colleen Serrault and Josan McGibbon, <laughs> um, produced by Ted Field and Robert W. Court for uh, Touchstone Pictures and Interscope Communications and distributed by Buena Vista, um, released in the US in November of 1990, in the UK in February of 1991, and in Ireland in March of 91. Um, the film grossed 100 and s- just under $168 million domestically uh, against its $11 million production budget. Um, I don't have international numbers, but it was obviously a huge hit. Uh, okay, so the plot of this sequel... Sorry, I didn't mention it's a sequel to Three Men and a Baby, which was a remake of it that is? French film that I, really? I just mentioned. Yeah. Which, uh, Should I have watched that before I watched it? <laughs> Um, (laughs) Peter, played by Tom Selleck, Michael, played by Steve Gutenberg, and Jack, played by Ted Danson, live with Jack's ex-girlfriend, Sylvia, played by Nancy Travis, and her daughter, who is now five years old, and was the baby in Three Men and a Baby, Mary, played by Robin Wiseman, um, whom the guys have raised together since infancy. Uh, Sylvia is pursuing a career on Broadway when she meets director Edward, played by Christopher Casanova, and quickly falls in love with him. Uh... Jew and well, she falls in love with him and is also pushed away from Peter because Peter can't bring himself to admit that he's in love with Sylvia. Uh, and she, we were led to believe that she would choose Peter over Edward, if not for the mm-hmm. fact that Peter was uh, refu- Peter refused to acknowledge his feelings. When Sylvia breaks the news that she's engaged and preparing to move to England and taking to take Mary with her, uh, the guys realize that Edward may not have her and Mary's best interests at heart and uh, pursue her to England. Um, yeah, well. Okay, so um, <laughs> I suppose we're going to have to talk a little bit about Three Men and a Baby. Um, 
Yes, I guess we are. A movie that I kind of like, but it's not very funny, is it? It's a... Have you seen the original of the original, the French no, film? I haven't. I imagine that the French film works a lot better because there's this whole crime subplot in uh, Three Men and a Baby, which should, I think, remain a subplot. But then as the film develops, it kind of becomes this the whole premise in a way. Um, Although I think, I think that's it's... one of the funniest things in the film, though, is the, the Well, Paul Gilfoyle's great. Yeah, he's really good on the comic misunderstanding about what the package is. Yeah, you know, yeah, that so that's thing. all great. But then it disappears, and then when it reappears... Yeah. Um, like <sighs> it's the tamest crime story ever told as well. Yeah, I mean it's a not artifact the first one. Um, because Danson, the kid's biological dad, disappears for the first half yeah, of the yeah, film. Yeah. Um, and I'd all I'd, I'd also forgotten the fact that can I just say that both of these films, pr- particularly this one, um, were VHS classics in my household. Okay. Um, I'd and seen Three Men and a Baby I, many times, but I, I don't think I had seen Three Men and a Little Lady more than maybe once or twice when I was a kid. So I didn't actually remember okay. much of this, particularly the second half of it. But another reason why it's an odd artifact, uh, the first one, is that as a result of Danson's disappearance for much of the film, we're left with Selick, who is the least comic of the performers. Yeah, I'm not saying he's, yeah. the, he's the least gifted of the actors, but he's at least comic. And Steve Guttenberg, who of the three, weirdly, is the, is the least funny. <laughs> um, yeah. Danson is definitely yeah. the funniest of the three. Definitely, and in the first film, I think Selick Selick's on another level when selling the the loss felt in the first film of when like the the baby is finally sort of taken away from them, or when he's led to believe that it's going to be taken away from by the mother Nancy Travis, right. who like appears in the first film, like in the final, not even the final third of the film, like the final reel. Yeah. Um, the crime, the crime story, the crime story wraps up, and then we're left with like, okay, well, what's going to fill the rest of this movie? And then yeah. Sylvia shows up, and so Sylvia is like, okay, so Sylvia left her six-month-old baby on the doorstep of her ex-boyfriend, disappeared for mm-hmm. how long? Would you say they have the kid? Danson is away for ten weeks, so yeah. they have they have her for like a few months, right? Yeah. Uh, she shows up, and then she just like says, you know, I'm taking her back. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, like, are you really? Like, are we going to go to court here? Like, <laughs> um, I'm not, I don't know what uh, yeah. like, you know paternity law is like in the U.S., but I mean, like, abandoning your six-month-old baby on the porch you might might be considered an unfit mother. But uh, yeah. so that's a little bit. And there's no there's no pushback from any of the three guys. Well, there's there's the, the Gutenberg and Selick, Peter and and Michael. They want uh, Jack to kind of step up and sort of intervene in some way, but there's never a question of like, we're not going to let her do that. You're like, yeah, or you shouldn't yeah. let her do that. Uh, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're which I think like, re- guys, realistically there would be though. It's like even, yeah. even not from a selfish point of view of wanting to, to um, keep the baby around, but like just for the, like out of concern for the baby's safety. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. So, okay, let's not spend too much time on the first film. Uh, well, uh, yeah, the, the second film for me is of immediate, immediately sorry of more interest because sylvia is present because mary herself now is old enough to be a character mm-hmm. so it's conceptually more focused around the family unit right um like it, it's it's kind of comical to think of the family's obvious wealth um and the way the script <laughs> sort of tries to complicate things right. like getting mary into school and the prejudices mary's going to face at school yeah, having, having three, three dads, dads one yeah. biological and two honorary etc yeah. and it's like they're fucking loaded yeah, that's man. actually one of the things that i really <laughs> love about the movie and i kind of have an opposite response to this kind of feature of movies in many cases uh, that, than other people do because i love yeah. how the first film kind of embodies this uh vision of the american dream where it's like you, yeah. you too can be like, you know, a creative uh, <laughs> architect or artist or actor and live yeah. in this like massive penthouse apartment in the middle of Manhattan and spend your <laughs> days playing Frisbee in Central Park. And like, it just makes life yeah. look like, like life in the eighties in the US look like, you know, this utopia, uh, which I really yeah. like, you know, I know other people would say, oh, that's, that's, that's a, that's a problem or whatever, but it's, I, I like that kind of time capsule aspect of that movie. Um, yes, yes. This one definitely. though. Okay. So. I mentioned when we talked about Chances Are that uh, we were going to also talk about the question of the comic premise uh, mm-hmm. in relation to this film. And there isn't one in the first half, right? So I was a lot of my notes here on the first half of the movie are just questioning whether this is even a comedy because there is no comic premise in the first half of this movie. There's In the first film, it's like, oh, these three middle-aged bachelors suddenly have to figure out how to be dads 
you know, mm-hmm. and they're, they kind of, um, you can see like comic, uh, scenarios, comic misunderstandings and comic ineptitudes arising out of that scenario, out of that premise. Mm-hmm. Uh, here there is no comic premise and there's no, their characters' relationships are not comic either. The dialogue isn't, and it's actually a melodrama for the first half of this movie. There's, there are a couple of, there's, okay, let's just get this out of the way. The rap scene, right? Which I, I, when that, when that scene started playing, I was like, oh my God, I remember this doing the rounds on Facebook years ago. And Mm -hmm. I had totally, like when I sat down to watch it this time, I had completely forgotten about it. And I don't think I have ever cringed as hard at anything as I did at Tom Selleck rapping. (laughs) (laughs) It's, it's, it is hard to watch. Um, and I also yeah, don't really understand some of the sounds that they're making as well, which, uh, it's, it's a, <laughs> no, they're doing like this, ooh, ooh, ah, ah stuff. That's like really, really weird. and not like, anyway, kind of racist, uh, maybe, po- but like not intentionally, of course, but it's like, it's also not an, a, a, like a mid eighties or late eighties rap trope either. So it's, it's, it's yeah. just a really bizarre scene. Um, yeah, and, Sheila Hancock as uh, Sylvia's mother, Vera, doesn't look too uh, pleased by it either. No. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, so like, so we're actually like 50 minutes in, okay, is when Sylvia and Mary leave, uh, and suddenly a minor comic premise is introduced, and that is the, the premise of the return to bachelorhood. Okay, so the three guys decide to throw a big party like they used to throw, and yep. it doesn't really satisfy them, and they're not really that interested, and they're kind of just all sort of caught up on the, the absence of, uh, of Mary. Um, and then that only lasts, like I said, a minor premise is 55 minutes in when they, when, uh, Peter and Michael go to England to, uh, to go to the wedding. And instantly this movie goes from being, to my mind, at least a mediocre ish melodrama Mm -hmm. to being a really, really, really funny romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. I think the second half of this movie is really, really funny. Like I laughed a lot through the second half of this movie once they got to England, and because it has the comic premise of, uh, you know, the fish out of water thing, it introduces this like cast of quirky Britons, you know, who yeah. are all played by these like great character actors. Highlight of whom is Fiona Shaw as uh, Miss Lomax, the headmistress Shaw of is excellent. of Pile. She is so she's good. so funny, and she's the headmistress of Pile Fourth Academy, right? So you've got not only that, you've got these this um this um sort of propulsive kind of structure introduced then where it's like the evil stepfather. Okay. So first of all, this dude is supposed to be a theater director and it's like, they just don't give a shit about that. And they just decide, okay, he's going to, once we get to England, he's going to be like this aristocrat. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's yeah, totally it's completely yeah. different characters. Uh, but he's the evil stepfather who doesn't like his, his soon to be stepdaughter. Uh, and once he has this secret plan to ship her off to Pileforth Academy, which is this like really strict boarding school, this like dour sort of button down boarding school for, for girls at the age of like six. So she's five and she's going to be going there when she's six. By the way, if the, we take the first film to be set in 1987 and she was a baby, then this is technically set in the near future. It's set in the early nineties, yes. right? So it's technically, this is technically science fiction. Um, so she, uh, we get this whole thing about like, we need to, we need to prove that cause he denies that he has he's ever, that he, he says that he's only planning to send her there when she's of an appropriate age. Right. So, yeah. uh, but actually he's planning on shipping her off there the, the, the you know, in the next uh, school term. Um, so we have Jack and, uh, sorry, not Jack. We have, we have Peter and Michael trying to prove, trying to get the documentation to prove that Edward is planning on sending Mary to that school that early because that would ultimately mean that he had lied to Sylvia and that would, you know, put the, put the kibosh on the, on the wedding. So you also have like Peter trying to, Peter kind of ultimately realizing how he feels about it. And it's, it's funny. I think that Jack is the one to, te- to get him to realize as well. It's a, it's a great heart to heart yeah. between Danson and Selick when, when the former finally, he finally uh, arrives up, yeah. in England and uh, Jack, Jack's great. Like Danson's great in that register even mm. like, in, in general, he's a lot better here than he, he is in the first film, but obviously we see him more. We do, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, he's, he, the, the second half of the film, I, I would disagree that the first half's mediocre, by the way, um, although I would I'd grant it's a more of a melodramatic register rather than a comedy. But um, this film, I think, nails those kinds of emotional shifts between, and but they're more apparent in the first, in, sorry, in the second half, because it, 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 almost at one point it's unfolding like a farce 
Yeah, absolutely. Like the, when, when, the when, speed with which all these dispersed things are. Yeah. Do you mean in particular when when uh, when Peter and uh, and Miss Lomax are like racing to get to the wedding? And <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. Like, that's yeah. very funny. Yeah, that's um, it. Um, but yeah, and then then yeah, the, 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 when Danson arrives and he's the, that heart heart's really great, very touching. Yeah. So like, so you get the introduction of this in, instantly halfway through. You get this like uh, fish out of water culture clash. Mm -hmm. uh, comic premise uh, visualized by the sight of six foot four Tom Selleck squashed into a, a Mini Cooper driving through the English country roads uh, that yep. are kind of like flooded with flocks of sheep and giving out about like all the things that he dislikes about England and uh, Steve Gutenberg saying something about like the way that uh, English people pronounce uh, schedule and vitamins. Do you say yeah. schedule? Yeah, okay. I say schedule. I say schedule as well. Yeah, obviously we say vitamins. Yeah, yeah. schedule is more. Is that like more of a class thing? Schedule, yeah, schedule, so. schedule. It might be, yeah. yeah schedule. Uh, so, like, I, I pronounce the T in often, whereas like uh, Southerners would say often. Often, yeah. So, T, uh, yeah, anyway, okay. So, um, and we just have, yeah, like like you said, it, it unfolds with this like really uh, like kind of propulsive rhythm uh, with like loads and loads of comic scenarios being introduced via the the um, quirky supporting cast, right? So you've not only got Fiona Shaw as Miss Lomax, who steals the movie, you've got um, the uh, slightly senile butler as well. Uh, <laughs> you've got the the vicar, who can't remember his uh, the theological syllogisms. Um, <laughs> he's like, he's trying to, he's trying to formulate them uh, verbally and can't. Um, so all that is really, really funny. Uh, the funniest line in the movie by far is when Miss Lomax uh, has taken a liking to Peter and she approaches him she, Peter's an architect and she knows that and he, she, she approaches him while he's looking out at the tent, being the wedding tent being put up and she just says awkwardly and kind of obliviously to the to the second meaning of, the, of, of what she's about to say uh, not so splendid as your mighty erections I imagine <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that's very good yeah, um, yeah I mean like Great things like uh, the, the like the, the trying to trying to delay the wedding while he goes to while Peter goes to pile forth to get the documents. Um, I also thought it was quite nice that, that Miss Lomax he just comes clean to her and she's just on his side. There's no resentment or whatever. Well, it's one. Of, it's another one of those films, isn't it? Whose complicating factors are resolved rather easily, and in this case, off screen because it's just like we cut away and then we cut back to like Miss um, Lomax, like completely like on Peter's side, yeah, yeah, and, like. Yeah. Uh, completely outraged by um what's his name's plans Edward, uh, yeah. Edward. uh so the the other the other really funny thing is like so they they try to delay Jack and Michael try to delay the wedding and uh <laughs> they they do it by uh Jack getting this is like something out of like a Jim Carrey movie or, or yeah. Eddie Murphy or something it's like they put they Absolutely. Jack has this like really convincing prosthetic um like makeup to make himself look like an old man, and his performance as the old vicar, who the other vicar can't make it, they say, and he, he comes in to, to officiate the wedding, and he's really kind of like scatterbrained, and uh, oh, <laughs> it's very funny. And oh, no. at, at the same time, uh, it's Michael, isn't it, who takes uh, the other vicar yeah. to yeah. supposedly to the wedding, but it's actually what's happening in the church is a funeral, and the vicar is late, so he runs in and just snatches one of the things and says <laughs> something about, like, um, welcome to the... Like, um, I'm glad to see everybody here on such a joyous occasion. <laughs> um, and also, like, I love the, the scene of the butler playing Blind Man's Bluff with, uh, with Mary. That's pretty funny, mm -hmm. too. Uh, mm -hmm. And like you said, Mary is an actual character here, and... I, what like, a crock! Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, and the, the scene where he, where she's telling Michael and Peter that Edward doesn't like her is very touching mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, also so the same thing watch. with Sylvia. The same thing with Sylvia saying, "I'm moving to England and I'm taking Mary with me." Like, who does she think yep. she is? <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Um, do you like Nancy Travers? Um. I do Sylvia Bennington like her, um, despite my misgivings about like the character and like yeah. the frustrations with the way how accommodating the three guys are to, of, of her. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and her her sense of like there's a certain kind of sense of entitlement on her part that's like, mm -hmm. like do you know that like what you did in the first film was like so wrong and so, uh, um, anyway, <laughs> okay, so. Well, 
I, I, I'm going to disagree with you on the first half of the film, though. Okay. Um, or in, in it being mediocre, because I, I do find, um, as a result of the more interesting premise here, um, what emerges or the space given to what I find interesting is the romantic attachment that forms or has formed between Sylvia and Peter and all of the kind of implicit unspoken connections uh, that find expression within that or don't find expression rather um, like Travis um, and sorry, uh, Sylvia and Peter are rehearsing the Rainmaker and then the kiss. Mm. Oh man, do you not find that electric? I mean, maybe it's maybe I'm it's so, the result it's of so sexy in this. I find the relationship <laughs> between them is very beautiful and it's very economically sort of depicted. Sure, Selick is great again. I think as this impossibly understanding, implausibly patient, yeah. very very beautiful man, and he is a beautiful man. <laughs> I mean, come on, now, nah, come on though. Um, and he also has the most beautiful dressing gown, by the way. Like that dressing gown that he wears in the first half of the film when he's like helping Mary on a computer or something. I never um, notice what people are wearing. Oh man! It's... Whenever anyone, whenever anyone says I love the costumes in that movie, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and we have to believe that in the first film because the emotional payoff after all of the farcical stuffs happened in the second part when the you know hmm. when, they, when they do finally get to the church when he's saying like you know. I, it's so funny because he, he he tells Sylvia that he loves her and he says, you know, I love I love the way you love Mary, and I'm like, what mm. the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you having a laugh, pal? Uh, um, so <laughs> I, you mentioned do I like uh, Nancy Travis? Uh, have you seen So I Married an Axe Murderer? Yes. Yeah, yeah she's yeah, very good in that. Nice. That's kind of what yeah. I know her primarily from. Okay, all right. So um, I'm gonna go with a seven on this one. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. like this, the second half is probably like a nine, <laughs> and the first half is a five. So I'll split the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, well, in the interests of giving these films more than you are, I'm going to give it an eight. <laughs> now I'm going to go with an eight. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. What do, What do you give the first one? Uh, five. Really? Yeah. That much? Okay. Yeah. All right. But um, I also watched this in the context of knowing that this was always the preferred film of the two. As it went, when when I was growing up watching it on VHS within my household. Um, I mean, I'm looking at yeah. IMDb here, and I've entered a rating of three for this. Oh, so, wow. like, in my memory, it wasn't good at all. Uh, mm. Bump that up to seven. Okay, um, moving on to his fourth film, uh, 1992's Sister Act. Girl groups? Boogie woogie on the piano? What were you thinking? I was thinking more like Vegas, you know, get some butts in the seats. And what next? Popcorn? Curtain calls? This is not a theater or a casino. Yeah, but that's the problem, see? People like going to theaters and they like going to casinos, but they don't like coming to church. Why? Because it's a drag. But we could change all that. See, we could we could pack this joint. Through blasphemy? You have corrupted the entire choir. I mean, sister, we could we could rock this place. Out of the question. As of tomorrow, Mary Lazarus resumes her leadership of the choir. Come in! Reverend Mother, I just wanted to congratulate you. I haven't enjoyed Mass this much in years. What a marvellous program. Innovative, inspiring. You're to be commended. I can't wait till next Sunday when the choir performs again. Did you see the people walk right in from the street? That music, that heavenly music... Reverend Mother, it called to them. It, it did? I must tell the Archbishop. I'll send him a personal letter describing your efforts. Your bold new fight to keep your little convent alive. And you must also include this. This is something she would never tell you herself because this is the kind of woman she is. Sisters, she wants us to go out into the neighborhood and meet the people. Sister Act was written by Joseph Howard and produced by Scott Rudin and Terry Schwartz for Touchstone Pictures and Touchwood Pacific Partners, distributed by Buena Vista Pictures and released on the 29th of May 1992 in the US and on the 20th of November in the UK and then a week later in Ireland. It made $231.6 million against a budget of $31 million. When lively lounge singer Dolores Van Cartier, played by Whoopi Goldberg, sees her mobster beau, uh, Vince LaRocca, played by Harvey Keitel, commit a murder, she is relocated for her protection. Set up in the guise of a nun in a California convent, Dolores proceeds to upend the quiet lives of the resident sisters. 
In an effort to keep her out of trouble, they assign Dolores to the convent's choir, an ensemble that she soon turns into a vibrant and soulful act that gains widespread attention. This is one of those films that I have, um, you know, had logged in my, you know, uh, viewing, not viewing tallies, because I haven't seen it since I started to keep a viewing log, but, it, you know, I retroactively listed it among the many, many, many films that I'd seen when I started to make a, a database of all the films I'd seen. But my most recent watch of it before watching it for this episode predated that by many years. And so, to be honest, as well as the sequel to this film, Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, um, I couldn't really remember it at all, to be honest. That's interesting, because this is by far of the six films here, the one that I'm most familiar with. I've seen right. both Sister Act films quite a few times. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it's also interesting that um, we were talking in relation to uh, there's a strange kind of uh, symmetry between uh, Ardolino taking on the sequel to Three Men and a Baby, which featured Mm -hmm. a crime plot that disappears Mm -hmm. into the background and is kind of like irrelevant to the main goings on in the movie. Well, not quite, but you know what I mean? Uh, Yeah. And then taking on Sister Act, which has the same thing happening with the, the crime plot that disappears and then reappears at the end. Uh, mm-hmm. And we talked about the first half of Three Men and a Little Lady having this question of, like, is this even a comedy in the first half? Mm-hmm. And the sequel to Sister Act, which is directed by Bill Duke, who played Mac in Predator, um, mm. has the same thing going on. This question of, like, is this a comedy? Yeah. What you, you mean? I just think it's a funny sort of coincidence uh, that the, the two yeah, films, yeah. the two yeah. uh, the two pairs of films line up in that in that kind of uh, idiosyncratic way. Um I really like Sistract. Um I think I, I don't think it's like when I watched it this time I I was kind of surprised by how funny it gets. Like it doesn't ever really it's not never really hilarious. No, but it's consistently um, amusing and charming. Yeah. And and, and um, corny. Is it corny? There's something corny about it. About the way the nuns are depicted, because the whole premise of the movie is that, you know, uh, Dolores is like there's a, a joke that Maggie Smith makes when when she first sees Dolores that you know she's been tasked with hiding this this Reno lounge singer and she walks in and and she says uh, that is not a person uh, that one can hide that is a conspicuous person that is someone who is designed to mm-hmm. stick out. But the whole premise is that she's so ill suited to being a nun and living the life of a nun. But all the nuns in the convent are weird and eccentric and, and atypical sort of nuns. You know what I mean? Like none of them are none yeah, of them yeah. uh, are particularly. Um, I don't know. It, it the the way that the nuns are depicted as sort of all of them sort of straining against the life of being a nun. You know, all of them are just dying to kind of like burst out of the con- the confines of of that sort of monastic life yeah and like Dolores's arrival is a, yeah, a little bit like catalyst. Robert Alex Robert Downey Jr's in Chances Are which also has a film in which a crime subplot just completely disappears um, um, yeah she sort of disrupts it and helps to catalyze yeah their, their sort of dormant rebellion or rebelliousness hmm. um, and you have to kind of roll with the in, you know discontinuity there between the ostensible, you know, rigid regime um, that Reverend uh, Reverend Mother, played by Maggie Smith, sort of imposes upon it, and yeah, their their sort of personalities. But it's easy to roll with because it's engaging, right? And it's got great performances um, by Wendy McKenna as Sister Mary Robert, and Sister Mary Patrick, played by uh, Kathy Najimy, um, who. Both, both, you know, both of whom are very, very good as sort of like the, you know, su- the key supporting roles to, to Dolores. Um, yeah, Kathy Najimy as Sister Mary Patrick is definitely the one nun I think who stands out as like, why is this person a nun? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and I was also I had never realized before that Wendy McKenna doesn't do around singing in this, which is a little bit yeah. disappointing. Her singing voice is dubbed by uh, Andrea Robinson. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know, like, that kind of is a little bit disappointing to me on some level. Why? What? I don't know, like, there's something uh, very 
cathartic and and uh, satisfying about like you know Sister Mary Robert discovering this like really powerful singing voice that she has. Mm, mm. Um, I don't know, just like shattered my illusions. Yeah, and we should also mention as part of the as another sort of key support is uh, Mary Wicks, as Sister Mary Mary Lazarus, yeah. um, who is sort of like this grouchy figure who is nevertheless has like a biting wit. Yeah. Like uh, I like it when um, they're having like ice cream or something. Mm. Um, and uh, well, we should also say she's the sister from whom Dolores takes responsibility. Uh, she succeeds her as the choir yeah. um, teacher. Mm-hmm. And she has this like raspy, husky voice. And I like it when they're eating ice cream, as I said, and she says, this is such an indulgence. <laughs> Didn't they have butter pecan? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's 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 a fun film that I'm very pleased that the crime element sort of does disappear in the, as quickly as it does and for the length it does, because uh, it's the least, you know, I, I know they have to have a means by which to get Dolores to the convent and a mm-hmm. reason for it conceptually. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's like, you know, fucking Harvey Keitel is Vince LaRocca, you know, Richard Portnow from uh, The Sopranos as well um, yeah. as Willie. Again, it's a very tame crime plot. Yeah, at least as a murderer. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, and you've got you've got Bill Nunn as Lieutenant Eddie Souther. Souther, mm-hmm. Souther. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, like all that that side of it is is. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of perfunctory. Um, the music, though, that's because I mean the main draw of the film is is the music, mm-hmm. uh, is uh, very catchy. It's catchy, but you know that first sort of rehearsal come performance that they give in the church? Mm. Um, it's so good. Like, the editing and the directing is so excellent. Like, all the sisters are sort of responding to their own newfound confidence. Yeah. And they're also responding to one another. And the camera is sort of, like, circling them um, as one one fluid movement. So you get, like, to see Dolores sort of guiding them. And you get to see them responding to her, and it's it's beautiful. It's it's it really sort of comes to life the film at that point. I think, mm-hmm. um, as it's you know as it's meant to. Um, it got to it got me thinking actually about what we might mean critically by a by a, a phrase such as feel good. Um, yeah. At least when applying it on a on a sort of scene to scene basis, like what constitutes that? And I think it's you know it's the basic building blocks like the cinematic grammar by which a film prompts sort of goosebumps like a physical response in you you know like or or another way to put it is like you know um the hairs of a, of your neck stand on end um and it's that and it's that mapping of uh, an individual or personal sort of triumphalism like you know acquiring confidence yeah. in that moment I that's kind of what i mean when i say that the discovering that andrea robinson dubbed yeah. Randy mckenna's voice is a little bit mm. uh that's the magic of the movies yeah i yeah. like i think that might be what i what i mean when i say that it's a little corny is like when you know the pope shows up at the end <laughs> and <there's, laughs> yeah. you know like they win him over with their uh unconventional um yeah you know church music and uh, religious music and uh, we there's a, there's a shot we never see the, we never see a close up of the Pope or anything like that you know but we see him kind of like tapping his hand or is it is, something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that he's like you know getting into the rhythm of it and it's like oh they've won over the Pope, the Pope you know mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. I don't know it's a little cheesy but um, the, the, the second the sequels are more cheesy and more corny I think I don't think so no nah? no nah. I you don't think like the because for the second one in the second one she sort of takes. Uh, responsibility or assumes the responsibility for uh, youths and not just yeah. their fellow sisters, uh, you know, d- disenfranchised, marginalized youths, um, primarily African American youths, um, and takes them to like a, a, a choir contest. Basically. Right. So the, the genre is, the, I wouldn't be surprised because it was, it followed very, very quick on the heels of the first one. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a spec script just lying around that was retrofitted with, with, uh-huh. uh, with, you know, sister Mary Clarence, mm-hmm. uh, because we said that the crime story in the first film is a pretext to get her into the convent. The pretext in the second film is barely there. It's just like, yeah, they're, they're all teaching now and they can't handle the kids at the school and they need her to come and teach 
or whatever. And then it's a question of like, well, why does she need to pretend to be a nun? So they have this throwaway line about like, first of all, she's pretending to be a teacher. Yeah. You know, that's probably a bigger deal. But uh, mm. she she's pretending to be a nun because something about the bishop wouldn't uh, like approve of a secular teacher coming in or something like that. But it's, it has no um, bearing on the story. The fact that she's pretending to be a nun at the end, they just they find out and they're like, "Oh, okay," you know. Yeah, well, there is yeah, there's an there's, attempt there's... to like expose her as this former showgirl or whatever. Yeah, but the kids um, don't care. So yeah, yeah, the kids you know. don't care. No, but it has a corny triumphalism to it when the kids like not only go to the contest, not only abandon their ostensible, you know, palatable uh, appearance. Um, but are told at the very last minute to wear what you want, wear, mm. what, you, wear what you feel comfortable in. They do that, improvise like some fucking stage magic, uh, you know, singing singing bound stage magic, um, and then they win the contest. And mm. so that's what I mean when I, you know, that's that's. I think you and I maybe don't mean the same thing when we say corny. There's something about okay. the way the nuns. Okay. Like, it's, it's the nuns in the first film that that mm. I, I. There's something about the way that they're represented. Mm. Uh, that is a little bit. I don't know what it is. Like, I'm, it's hard to put my finger on exactly what it is about the way. I was thinking, like, is it is it just their habits? <laughs> like, if they, like putting them in a casino and like, you know, this kind of seedy bar that they go to at one point, they follow mm -hmm. uh, Dolores out late at night. Uh, is it just that? Is it that like mm -hmm. the the incongruity? Because I actually think Sister Mary Robert Wendy McKenna, who's a novitiate and isn't yet wearing the full habit, doesn't seem as oddly comical or something like that. Something about the full habit that makes me kind of... I don't know. It's, it's something about... I don't know. I, I actually... Yeah. I, I can't really articulate what I mean here. It's something just something about nuns. Uh, I'm not sure I would feel the same way if it was like monks in monastic robes. Something about... Maybe it's even just the headdress or something. It's something funny about it or something. I don't know. Yeah. It's... Um, the headdress is like sort of constrictive... Uh, yeah. <laughs> to the actors and restrictive in terms of what we can see of them. Um, yeah, so you've got that sequence here like where um, they, they're given permission by Reverend Mother to sort of go out into the community mm. after the scene we've just heard. Um, and there's like that montage sequence of you know, them going literally out into the community like as an outreach sort of program and uh, yeah, like Kathy, Kathy Najami, in particular, has a, I don't know, like an outlandishness to her physical comedy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so it's it's playing on that sort of in, incongruity. Yeah, the thing about the second film is that, like I said, in relation to the first half of uh, Three Men and a Little Lady, mm. it's not really a comedy. Because there's a, there's a lack of a comic premise, you know, it's just like one of these kind of uh, like this, you know, quietly heroic teacher who, you know, perseveres and, and reaches a student and changes their lives. That kind of mm. inspirational story. Um, but it's a stall vehicle as well, right? For Lauren Hill. No, well, I no for Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I actually think the Lauren Hill things handled very uh, lazily in the That's second film. Very much so, yeah. I think so too. It's it's um, very it's it's all it's all too easy. So yeah, it, it doesn't absolutely. it doesn't work as the kind of the the melodrama that it's trying to be, or that it ostensibly yeah. is. It's like it's like they yeah. it's like they had a, 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 a melodrama spec script lying around, and they went, let's make this a sister act movie, but didn't do the work necessary to turn it into a comedy. But let's not um, let's come back to the first film because uh, Ardolino didn't direct the second one. Did you ever notice that Whoopi Goldberg doesn't have eyebrows? Um, I I had noticed. I had never uh, noticed it before, and then once I noticed it, I had to, had to pause the film and Google it. And there's lots of articles about like this. <laughs> this will blow your mind. Whoopi Goldberg yeah, yeah. doesn't have eyebrows, and I was then like googling pictures of like Whoopi Goldberg. Apparently, she um shaved them off at one point, and then mm. they when they grew back, they were itchy, and then she shaved them off again, and she just basically was like, I like the way it looks, and I like having no hair on my face, and. It's mm. very distracting once you notice it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have anything else to say about it? Um, not really. I would I would um agree with you. 
because I got into formal stuff um, in terms of like directing and, and, and the, as the basis of the feel good qualities of the Fulham when you mentioned that the songs are catchy and I didn't actually agree with you that yes they are very catchy um, and yeah I mean I had I will fact, follow him and stuck in my head yeah yeah that's great the and the fact that the fact that Goldberg and Najimi are singing their own songs I mean you know I don't know. I I wasn't distracted by the fact that Makina's not, and I wasn't disappointed that she's not. But yeah, I mean, it has. It, there's there's similar moments in the second one as well. Not to come back to it too much, but uh, where like you know that whole thing of people feeling energized and boosted and whatever else, and and sort of take seizing the moment for expressing themselves. Uh, and it works. There's something very, it's very difficult to sort of critically formulate praise around it because it happens in such a sort of weird involuntary, you know, when it works, it, it happens in such like a, a an effortless way. Mm. And the physiognomic effect that it has on, on viewers, uh, you know, what we mean when we say something's transportive is that kind of thing. Like it completely sweeps you along. Yeah. Um, my question is, is one or two of even three of those scenes enough for a film? Yeah, the film, I think the film could definitely do with being funnier, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but do you find making more of the, um, the lifestyle shift that Mm -hmm. Dolores has to go through to, to remain undercover, um, because Goldberg's great. Yeah, right? she's really good. As a, as a great comic presence who is streetwise or street smart, however you want to phrase it, in a way that the other nuns were led to believe aren't. Yeah. Um, and she has a fast talking sort of, uh, you know, wit to her. Um, that is That is conditioned by her previous environment. Um, so yeah, I agree that that more could perhaps be made of that. Nevertheless, I really like this film. What would you give it? Seven. Yeah, I'm going to settle for a high seven. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to give it an eight, but I don't like it as much as the highs in Three Men and a Little Lady. And, and <laughs> Three Men and a Little Lady. So it's a hard title to say, yeah. isn't it? Three men and a little little, little, little. Uh, It's easier for us to say than the French one. (laughs) Okay, so let's move on to his fifth film, 1993's The Nutcracker. In a child's eye, a bit of light can be a snowflake. A flash of colour can be a Christmas tree. A wooden toy can be a hero. This holiday season, let the magic of imagination take flight. As Macaulay Culkin joins the New York City Ballet to bring a timeless classic to life. Balanchines, the Nutcracker. Now the magic is a movie. All right, so the Nutcracker, produced by Robert Hurwitz and Robert A. Krasno, for Warner Brothers Family Entertainment, Electra Entertainment, and Regency Enterprises, and distributed by Warner Brothers Pictures, released in the U.S. in November of 1993, and in the U.K. in December of 1994. Uh, according to Box Office Mojo, it only grossed uh, just over $2 million domestically against a production budget of $19 million. Hardly can have been a surprise to anybody involved. Mm. Uh, this one is written by, or the narration rather, the, the uh, sparse narration is written by Susan Cooper. And the production is based on Peter Martin's stage production of The Nutcracker, which is the ballet uh, music by Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky and uh, dance choreography by George Balanchine. Okay, so in this live-action adaptation of Tchaikovsky's fantastical ballet, 
Young Marie, played by Jessica Lynn Cohen, aw awakens on Christmas Eve to find the toys and mice have grown much larger and a villainous rodent ruler begins to torment her. Coming to Marie's aid, however, is the Nutcracker Prince, played by Macaulay Culkin, who protects her from the evil mouse amidst lively dance sequences. Also inhabiting this dreamy realm is the Sugar Plum Fairy, played by Darcy Kistler, and her dashing cavalier, played by Damien Witzel. Um... Well, first off, I don't like the tone with which you read all of that. I can't believe you made me watch this. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm... you know the reason why the reason why I suggested Emil Ardolino um, to for the, for this episode was because it's going to be our last traditional journeyman episode before Christmas, and I knew that the Nutcracker would satisfy both of our needs, not only to watch a Christmas film that neither of us had seen before, but also one starring Macaulay Culkin, fresh off of uh, the success of Home Alone 2, Lost in sure. New York. I mean, that's um, one thing to do when you have an unmarketable film. You just, like, put the... Like, I mean, is this yes. a family film? Is this, like, it clearly is, like, the reason that they've put Macaulay Culkin in this movie is, you know, like you said, he's this, the, you know, child star of, the, of that moment. Uh, and mm -hmm. the hope would be Obviously, some of the, the Nutcracker musical compositions are used in Home Alone, so they, they're used prominently in the trailer. And it's like, oh, mm -hmm. that kid from Home Alone. And, you know, they're playing the Home Alone music, and maybe we should take the kids to see this. And, like, I mean... Yeah, I mean, when you say Home Alone music, <laughs> yeah. people, people making the same assumption that I did in watching Home Alone, not realizing that the airport running sequence is scored by... Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker. I thought, oh, the fucking homage in John Williams. Yeah, yeah. No, there, there are two pieces though. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a piece later on as well. Yeah, there's yeah. two. Yeah. Uh, so like, uh, Kevin Klein reads the the sparse narration, which uh, Macaulay mm -hmm. Culkin's dad apparently uh, objected to, didn't want that included at all, and said that if they included it, that that uh, Culkin wouldn't do any press for the movie. So they took the narration out of the movie, and then. Uh, Culkin's dad showed up with a list of further demands for changes to the film, and the producer was so pissed off with that that he uh, restored the narration and accepted that they weren't going to have any press from from the Culkins. Uh, wow! I'm sure this would have been a huge hit had Culkin done the press tour. Um, I mean, so like the, the 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 narration is there. It reminds me. I think it was uh, what cartoon was it? Um, this, I can't remember the name of the cartoon. It might have been Voltron or something like that. One of those like Japanese cartoons that was in, imported to the to the US in the in the seventies or eighties, where it just made so little sense that they had to put in uh, a robot character who was basically like in the space station watching the action going on and, and explaining what was happening for the benefit of the audience. That's what that's mm -hmm. what the the narration and this just kind of intermittently pops in and it sounds a little bit like a sleepy vaguely disinterested director's commentary or something like that talking about what's mm -hmm. happening explaining what's happening um which uh, i felt that i needed so i can't imagine a child watching this but i was gonna ask i was gonna ask um if if the handy google synopses weren't available to us for each episode when we're introducing the, each segment wh would you have had trouble synopsizing this film no not really i suppose because it's fairly plotless isn't it it's just like the kid falls asleep and after a while, it yeah. is, yeah. So, like the you know, so we, the plot essentially is that the all these guests come to the house on Christmas. I presume it's Christmas Eve, and mm. they bring presents for the kids. So one of them is the, the this like elderly toy maker or something. I don't know. It play, he has an mm. eye patch and kind of mad like you know Doc Brown kind of hair. Uh, played by I think Bart Robinson Cook uh, Drosselmeyer, mm. and he gives uh, Marie this toy Nutcracker, right. Um, shaped like a, you know, like a um, soldier or whatever that you crack the you crack the nuts in the in the soldier's mouth. Um, and then one of the kids like takes it and breaks it or something, and he repairs it. And then she falls asleep on the couch and then wakes up in the middle of the night. And like it said in the synopsis, everything has grown huge. And that, that's kind of the only moment in the movie that I really enjoyed was that minimalist uh, exercise in minimalist imagination in that sequence where. She wakes up and there are these mice, like which are you know actors in big uh, furry mouse costumes running around the stage. Yeah, sort of maybe yeah. actors probably not the right word, like you know ballet dancers. Then the Rat King shows up and he has like seven heads. And then the Nutcracker comes to life and it is Macaulay Culkin and Macaulay Culkin has this big long white beard 
uh, and this black mustache drawn on for some reason, and like rosy red cheeks, and he sword fights with the Rat King, with the seven-headed Rat King, and defeats him, and then they they fly on this bed across these like snow-capped pine trees, and like land in this in this uh, you know forest clearing, and it started to remind me in its design of like. I don't know if you ever played Banjo Kazooie on the Nintendo 64, like the snowy levels. It yeah, gave yeah. me this like desire to play that game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like from that point on, that's about there's about 35 minutes to go. That was, the movie's only like 85, mm-hmm. 86 minutes uh, mm-hmm. plus credits. From that point on, it is ballet, 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 ballet. What's wrong with that? I mean, yeah. So that's the question. Well, so that's, that's the question. Ballet, it, well, that's the thing. Is like I don't necessarily think it is an adaptation so much as it is a staging of that production for the cameras. Right, so sure. like how what's your relationship with ballet? Love it. No, I I, I I've never been to one. I, I think we had this conversation when we talked about Black Swan, didn't we? On the Arrow. Yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, like for me ballet it kinda leaves me mildly impressed, uh, but never wowed or enthralled and like not intellectually or emotionally engaged. Uh, partly because I don't like the music that they dance to, but also it's just it's an awful lot of like leaping and twirling and tiptoeing, which I would have thought you would have responded to because it's a little bit like well, a Terrence Malick uh, waif. Fuck you! I'm not. I'm not answering <laughs> to that. I'm not going to legitimize your fucking snarky tone here by even responding to that. Um, I it certainly leaves me a lot more impressed than you seem to be by the physicality of it all and you know as, as see that's the thing it's like it there's there's definitely an impressive physicality to it and that's what i mean when i say it's like i'm mildly impressed but like you know I'm, i'd be mildly impressed watching somebody like do you know a hundred pull-ups or something like that it, it's you know it's it's like physically impressive. I, mean, I can do it i can do a hundred pull-ups if you want me to <laughs> you um, know what i mean it's like there's, there's not yeah. like impressive physically impressive and aesthetically uh engaging or they're not the same thing so yes, it is certainly physically impressive and physically demanding and so on. But so is like, you know, hundred yard sprint or whatever. It's it's not the same value. Do you know what I mean? I do. Um, and so right, it's let's pull back a bit here because it's interesting for me to to after watching this, thinking like, well, you know, what what did other people make of it? You know, like as in ter- in terms of film reviewers and film critics, you know, how have they responded to something which is, I agree, merely a, a, a filmed ballet. Um, and, you know, yeah. just just a cursory look at some of the critical responses as quoted on Wikipedia, many of them pick fault with Culkin, as if like that's their only point of interest and their only point of, like, expertise. Yeah. So the marketing um, worked on them. Yeah. That's why they showed up. Um, one even like one even suggests like he's forgotten how to smile like but to be honest he smiles quite a lot i was mm-hmm. like what like yeah. you didn't see you didn't see the same film as i did um but even more common than that is the assumption that this doesn't somehow um maximize its 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 cinematic grammar uh in capturing the play like um Which i would contest absolute... really you want to contest that? i would con- i would contest it because there's this critical assumption that pure cinema is montage and close-ups and all close-ups like so granted both of these are uniquely cinematic like montage and Mm close-up but the decision not to always utilize them is i think a cinematic choice and like you know like a little bit like um not voting is is seen as a political choice besides there are close-ups here and there is montage it's not like fast it's not like approximating the 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 rhythm of the bodily movements no um but it's there is montage and there's even camera movement like an Ardolino yeah. demonstrates his talents i think here at knowing when and when not to you know quote, quote unquote intervene um and when when to let it sort of look like a stage play uh, not a stage play like a, a stage performance um with the you know the retained proscenium arch and whatever else mm-hmm. and then when and when not to go in closer. Um, so, I mean, it's cinematic for me, and it is cinema by virtue of it being filmed. Um, hey, totally, so I totally agree that it's cinema, and I think the adjective cinematic is uh, uh, carries a lot of, yeah, sort of aesthetic prejudices along with mm-hmm. it. I think it's often kind of meaningless to talk about what is and isn't cinematic. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of, like, 
you know, I think we'll talk maybe a little bit more about this when we talk about the next film, but yeah, mm-hmm. yes, simply cutting, you know, yeah. simply moving the camera. Like those are inherently cinematic. Yeah. Uh, like you, it's, 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 it's not demonstrative. Well, it's not, maybe like, that's not fair to say that they're inherently cinematic because you, you know, they're, they're inherently, um, you know, screen based, uh, formal, t- um, f- features of the screen form, you know, it's, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's cause obviously like you, you, do the same thing in live TV. And that's, that's kind of the thing for me is like, if you were to, f- if you were to literally film a stage production of the Nutcracker, mm-hmm. a lot of it would look like this because you would have, Absolutely. you would have these wide shots of the ballet, like uninterrupted wide shots. And then in terms of the extent to which you would have cutting, you would have, it would be those, it would be like, you know, multi- a multi-camera setup, which this appears to be right. Yeah. So like yeah. you've got, you, like you said, the, the proscenium composition and the ballet just playing out on the stage. And at, at that point, in the like, like I said, in the second half of the movie, it's just it, it almost comes across as a threat. I think when she says it, the sugar plum fairy says, you know, and then she and we get the narration, and then the sugar plum fairy said that as a treat, all of the all of the different uh, whatever they are, it's like dancers who represent like different types of treats, like chocolate and candy and whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're all going to perform for the for the Nutcracker and his queen or whatever. I was like, oh my god. Um, <laughs> again reminded me of a video game thing where it's you get to the end of the last level and before you fight the final boss you have to fight every boss you've beaten through the whole game you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing uh like it's yeah it's it's a hard sit for me the, the second half of the movie but when when that's playing out you're getting the wide shot and then you're cutting to a kind of like slightly diagonal shot that's a little bit of a closer composition mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which looks it just feels like it literally just feels like a filmed ballet and at that point, the film ceases to have any kind of uh, filmic value to me, and I'm left kind of going, "Okay, how do I just how do I feel about ballet? How do I feel about sitting through 40, mm. 40 straight minutes of ballet?" Not so happy. Yes, well, the wide proscenium shots that you've just mentioned uh, in the latter stages of the film, our gaze as viewers might be free to wander the frame, but the frame and the framing are all we have. So like there's, there's, so it is still, because in, in, if you were sitting there in a theater, you would be able to, you know, look at other distractions, you know, like, uh, sure. But forget about, forget about the distinction, between, forget about the distinction, the distinction between watching this film and what, and, and actually attending a live ballet sure. and make a comparison between watching this film and watching a telecast of a ballet. Like you, you know, I often see programmed in cinemas today. Yeah, 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 sure. Like what's, called what's alternative the, content Saturday sure. night. So what's the difference there? Um. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there is one. Yeah, I would say very um, little, particularly in the second half of the movie. Like there is that sequence, yeah. uh, like I said, where you know where she wakes up and there's a kind of a cool uh, shot from her perspective of the Christmas tree growing really, really large. And at yeah, that point, amazing. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. maybe because I, I, my patience was already wearing thin at that point. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, that's about maybe 30 minutes into the movie or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, maybe this is going to take a turn now that she's asleep and now that she's in this fantasy world. Uh, and then we get the fight with the Rat King and we get the, the you know, the, the flight over the, the trees in the bed. But then it just settles into feeling like a, tele- a ballet telecast. Mm. Um, but, okay, so then you're moved to sort of ask, okay, yeah, so how do I feel about ballet? As you said, um... I admire and find, ultimately, I suppose, I, I suppose I find it quite absorbing in terms of, of allowing the ballet itself to be the primary focus. Am I? Do I find the ballet itself absorbing, though? Mm, I mean, I, I is that, is that even, like... like as this as the pure spectacle of you know bodies choreographed, yes, but this is also like story bound. Mm, kind of, I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, even, look, even, look, even look, like look, at what, try... look at what's happening in the in, in that sequence. You've got Macaulay Culkin and Jessica Lynn Cohen sitting at the back of the stage, sitting yeah. up up stage, yeah, uh, facing out into the you know, facing us, let's say, mm-hmm. in the audience, mm-hmm. and the dancers also facing us. So it's like, what's story bound about that? Now that's what I mean. Like, uh, uh, even even Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker like abandons any sort of semblance of plot 
yeah. to prioritise, yeah, the, the sort of, I may be misusing a, a term here, but the spectacle of it, what I would say, the spectacle of it. Sure. There's no um, problem with that at all. I mean, like, the, no, 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 it's not. not it's, it's not plot that I was missing. It's just that, like, if you replace the plot with something other than ballet, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, the ballet dancing in this and this the kind of the abstract approach to it that you're sort of suggesting of like just mm. appreciating it as bodies choreographed bodies in mm. motion how does that compare to like the dancing and dirty dancing yeah i mean it doesn't turn me on <laughs> um we'll call the not sexy in this <laughs> he's so sexy in this though as the nutcracker particularly when he has his little beard um, um i i don't know like i know what you for mean me, yeah, but- like, because because something that you you mentioned there, you said that you appreciate the ballet sort of being laid out as a spectacle, mm. uh, but the and you find it you find sorry I can't remember exactly how you put it you find it absorbing that the ballet is allowed to be the main focus, but yeah. you don't find the ballet itself absorbing. I mean, is that not like saying mm. if you put anything in front of the camera, and just simply the by virtue of the fact that it is placed in front of the camera, <laughs> that would be absorbing, irrespective of whether the thing itself is absorbing. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe is that, a good is that, analogy is that the, is that the nature is, uh, of is that the nature of slow cinema? Well, it's it's yeah, it's the uh, it's I was going to make an analogy to uh, you know screen tests by Andy Warhol of like yeah. watching people's faces for a lot longer than you might ordinarily watch them, or, or your face by timing Liang this year, you know, his new film, which is basically a succession of headshots um, that make a point of their being headshots. Or, the, or the, um, like the, I don't know, like those James Benning films that you liked, or like three hours of, of trains passing, or whatever. Like yeah. That stuff. So, it has a sort of certain conceptual value for you mm-hmm. outside of its aesthetic value. Yeah, I yeah, but but this this operates on a different level because this is uh cap. Um, yeah, this doesn't really seem to be like high in its concept or demanding in its concept. It's not like no, it's familiar to you if you've ever seen a, a telecast sure. of a stage. Yeah, performance. it's it's not like making a point of following one of the supporting dancers, regardless of what she or he's doing. Do you know what I mean? Which which hmm. would ultimately, it's not like Zidane. You know that that film um, that follows Zidane on a three sure. out one football match, regardless of what he's doing at that time. <sighs> So yeah, I mean, I, I guess it comes down to me. I I I probably sit through a ballet feeling less impatient than you would. Yeah, possibly. All right. So, what's your rating for this one? Six. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, two. Two. Fuck. Really? Wow. But like, it's hard to say. Could through. you? But could you not like? You know, I know you've already acknowledged and recognized your sort. Well, yeah, let's call them prejudices, but the, the, disinterest. Yeah, the, the critical tastes, maybe, maybe. I just like, I mean, ballet is just not my. I'm just not interested. It doesn't do anything mm-hmm. for me, you know. Like, yes, it's it's physically demanding, but no, it's not absorbing or or uh, you know compelling in its in the, in the specificity of its physical of its sure. of its physicality. Sure. You know, uh, there are lots of physical uh, things that that are physically impressive but have no aesthetic yeah. value and i'm not saying ballet has no aesthetic value but it, it is very repetitive it's very it's a lot of leaping and twirling and tiptoeing i feel the same way about like figure skating as well there's a lot of like twirling around and like it's i don't know it's like limited in its physical vocabulary or something like that which i'm sure the more into it you are the more you can appreciate the nuances and the little minor differences and so on like in a musical genre that you're very familiar with you know somebody who isn't can't can't appreciate the minor distinctions, minor variations. Um, sure. What was the film in the last episode where we kind of had this same conversation? Uh, oh, I am Wrath, where we talked about like, yeah. you know, that maybe I, I'd seen more of those films and could appreciate kind of more of its minor sort of variations and so on. So mm-hmm. that's certainly true, but I don't really have any great desire to, you know, dive into um, the ballet as an art form. Bourgeois filth. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to his final film, 1993's made-for-TV Gypsy. Honey, 
Honey, it's gonna be fine. Everything happens for the best. Okay, so the act's finished. But you and me and our daughter, we're gonna have a home. Say, we even got a cow for the backyard. Why, we are gonna be the best damn family ever was. I'm used to people walking out. When my own mother did it, I cried for a week. Your father did it. Then the man I married after him did it, and... Well... This time I ain't crying. This time I'm apologizing. To you. I pushed you aside for her. I made everything just for her. No, Mama. Now she says I can't make her an actress like she wants to be. The boys walked, but they think the act is finished. They think we're nothing without her. She's nothing without me! I'm her mother, and I made her! And I can make you now. I'm going to make it up to you for all the years I pushed you in the back. And I will, my baby. I swear I will. I'm going to make you a star. I'm going to build a whole new act all around you. It's going to be better than anything we ever did before. Better than anything we even dreamed. Rose, listen. You're right, Herbie. It is for the best. The old act was getting stale and tired. But the new one, look at the new star. She's going to be beautiful. She is beautiful. Finished. We're just beginning and there's no stopping us this time. Gypsy was written by Arthur Lorenz based loosely on 1957's Gypsy, a memoir by Gypsy Rose Lee, produced by Emile Ardolino with Cindy Gilmore and Bob Weber for Storyline Entertainment, All Girl Productions and RHI Entertainment. And it was originally broadcast on CBS in America in, on the 12th of December 1993. Ambitious stage mother Rose Hovick, played by Bette Midler, wants desperately for her daughter June, played by Jennifer Rhea Beck, to become the vaudeville star she never was. With the help of savvy but kind-hearted agent Herbie Summers, played by Peter Reigert, Rose realises her aspirations for June, but when her new star rebelliously elopes, June's shy sister Louise, played by Cynthia Gibb, reluctantly steps into the spotlight, transforming herself into the legendary burlesque star Gypsy Rose Lee. Um, I think one's appreciation of this film uh, or of the film's structure would be enhanced by a familiarity with the biographical histories it's referring to uh, because it's quite difficult to recognise the sorts of subtle shifts in focus of this film. Uh, you might argue if they're subtle or not. Um, and you might miss the significance of certain things um, if you're not really able to map them, as I wasn't, against the real-life characters or the real-life mm -hmm. figures. Uh, like, I, So I'd, I'd wish I'd known, basically, going into this, the history before watching it, because I could have then anticipated certain beats, even when it was kind of sort of boring me. So we should say at the outset, yeah, this is a musical. Yeah. This is a two-and-a-half-hour um, musical. Dude. Oof, you said that was such disdain. Well, that's actually one of my issues with musicals. Like, you know, the actual content of the of the, the genre, generally speaking, doesn't appeal to me. Uh, mm. But another thing is the bloated running times, which is, you know, a consequence of so much time being taken up by the musical performances and still having to tell the story. So, you know, mm -hmm. I picked up a DVD of My Fair Lady one time and I was like, wow, three hours, <laughs> not a chance. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh... What about Lav Diaz's musical? Would you see that? I forget his name. He's Was made he? one, though. No, I yeah. wouldn't. That'll be, <laughs> that'll be fun. But related to the points that I've just mm. said, though, right? Like, not knowing really the histories. So, for instance, this is a film called Gypsy, starring Bette Midler. Right, who doesn't play Gypsy. Based, yeah, so based on a memoir by her daughter, one of her yeah. two daughters. So I thought fucking for much of the running time here, Bette Midler was playing Gypsy. Yeah, me too. I mean, that's what you would, you would think, wouldn't uh, you? Like the, the, the poster, yeah. or I mean, uh, yeah, the promotional poster is, it says Bette Midler, Gypsy. You, I know? Mean, you know, and you can understand why Bette Midler was positioned as like the focus of the marketing campaign behind this film, uh, it being made in 1993. But like the Gypsy, as in Gypsy Rose Lee, doesn't emerge until the final half hour. That's true. And it's a pretty... Yeah. And it's a pretty sudden embrace of the spotlight by Louise when, once we get there. Like, we get a very sudden progression in her confidence, in her aptitude as a stage presence, in her persona. Yeah. Like, basically, it's a two-and-a-half-hour film, as you've just said, about somebody's transformation from untalented stage presence into a kind of burlesque icon. Yeah. 
but the transformation itself doesn't take place until the last yeah. half hour. And then, it, and then she transforms back again. Yeah, it's like so she, she this becomes weirdly... this kind of like diva for like five minutes, and then she goes out and reconciles with her mom because her mom does it. Like you know, Bette Miller performs this song that kind of sums up her. Well, her like oh, man. her belated realization that um, like she has a breakdown, basically right. a, bre- a breakdown on stage in in the form of a musical number. Um, it's 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 got this weirdly mystifying quality to it that runs counter to what the premise itself suggests. Yeah. Um, like, how does Gypsy become that stage presence? And we don't really get that history. It's basically no, it, about to, to me, Rose like, yeah. Hovick, the Bette Midler character. It, it, yeah, okay, so it's basically about Rose Hovick. But yeah, I agree. I mean, but for me, the film lacks any depth. Mm. Because there's no psychological depth to Rose either. Mm. She's just this cartoonish stage mother. Mm. There's not, like, we never know her past or whatever. She's just, like, devoted to vaudeville and obsessed with turning uh you know her more talented uh or at least more you know musically talented daughter uh june into a star a vaudeville star sure and then you know whatever and then so like the the, the the drama it only works on like an abstract conceptual level it doesn't actually work on an emotional level at all there's like no point at which i was connected to this uh and i i mean yeah, like you said, it's the last half hour, but it's even it's like ninety minutes before they even get to the burlesque house. Like it takes forever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like they were given a mandate to make it two and a half hours long. Like you'd have to fill a three hour T V slot or something like that, and they were like, Oh, well, it's maybe a ninety minute story, but like make it two and a half hours. Um I mean uh, thematically, like there's like you've got the whole like historical um issue of like the end of the vaudeville era because of the talkies and mm-hmm. you've got like, you know, broken showbiz dreams and um, the whole like question of like stage mothers and you know mm-hmm. parents li- living vicariously through their children in the entertainment business, you know, but it, it just never develops any depth on any of those topics, and we suffer through full length performances of and like repeated performances of the same pieces in some cases, uh, because you know the whole idea is that they've been playing these roles. These they, they start off as kids. By the way, um, I had to pause the film when uh. We get a, one of our first close-ups of um, of Louise as a kid mm. because I was like, "Wait, is that Elizabeth Moss?" Yep. I googled it, and yes, it is. It's a, it's a tiny little Elizabeth Moss yep. who has such a distinctive face that I recognized her immediately. Uh, then I also saw that the other kid is played by a very young Lacey Chabert, um, who doesn't really look the same as she does. Like I know her best from uh, Mean Girls, mm. but um, yeah, then they. They grow up and the uh, Rose continues to have them performing the same parts where they're basically... How old would you say they're supposed to be once they're grown? 17, 18? Yeah, but played by, yeah. like, 30-year-olds. Yeah, I'd say they're supposed to be kind of... They're, they're, on, they're kind of on the cusp of, like, adulthood or whatever and on the cusp of independence because June takes off with Tulsa yeah. and leaves. That's the reason that, that Rose shifts her attention to Louise. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I watched the trailer for the other one that stars... Um, What's her name from West Side Story? Uh, Natalie Wood. Natalie Wood, yeah. Uh, it looked exactly the same to me. Like it, it, it looks like a film, whereas this is like another kind of f- feels like a filmed play, with more of an effort to make it, you know, with more of an effort to incorporate kind of traditional film uh, grammar into the presentation. There's yeah, not I mean, quite like, as much. Yeah, you still have a lot of those wide shots of the stage where there's no audience. We don't get shots of the audience. No, no. I mean, uh, like the the, the 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 acoustics of you know the the the, the people's voice. I said it is, again in relation to I Am Roth uh, last episode, but the timbre of people's voice here yeah, portrays the studio bound uh, production. Mm. Um, but uh, it feels kind of claustrophobic. Doesn't yeah, it? there's a lot of mid shots and the staging and blocking seems to sort of maximise the, the 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 claustrophobic living or sense of living in, in these kinds of conditions. But the cinematography itself is amazing. Like it doesn't look like a nineties film at all or nineties production at all here. Like I find it almost feels like something from the sixties. You didn't you're not going for it? I wasn't really You hate colour though, don't you? Impressed with it, yeah. I don't know. I, I wasn't really impressed with the cinematography. I do just because of how sort of not of its time, it looks. Um, I don't know if it was intentionally trying to sort of approximate 
you know, the earlier era, but um, it, it, it felt very evocative and rich in that sense to me. Um, obviously <laughs> helped by the fact that Bette Midler's uh, got, you know, bright orange hair in it. <laughs> yeah. um, what did you think of Bette Midler's performance? <laughs> well, wouldn't disagree with you when you said it's lacking in sort of psychological depth. And Would therefore, you agree with me when it's cart- that it's cartoonish? The performance itself. So yeah. her character's lacking psychological depth, and therefore it's difficult to gauge a performance. It's is it cartoonish? I mean, there's there's certainly a more respectful way to phrase that. I think, <laughs> um, like her, everybody around her mm-hmm. uh, is seems to be in a film, like and playing it like playing it for film, where she seems to be playing it for like fucking pantomime or something like that. It's it's so all these like mad physical gestures and that, that thing where she like leans her head back, but looks down. Yeah. And has like crazy like, eyes. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, very pre hocus pocus, isn't it? Yeah. I mean like that's kind of, well, I mean, I really, I really like hocus pocus, but it also reminded me of uh, her performance, her guest spot on Seinfeld where Kramer is obsessed with her and she, oh, yeah. she's, she's doing, she's, she's, she's the lead in the musical adaptation of their, their running joke, Rochelle, Rochelle. Yeah. You know, uh, which um, started out as a movie in, in in cinemas, and then it was on video. There was an episode where George is renting it, and uh, a lot of a lot of nudity in that movie. It's like a film, is what it is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I don't know. Maybe it was the Seinfeld thing, but like there was a moment where I thought, wait, did that Seinfeld, that Seinfeld episode came out after Gypsy? Is that mm. reference back to Gypsy? Because it's the way she performs the the music, and that is very reminiscent of uh, mm. her performance here. I don't know. I think this the is final, just like another. Yeah, sorry. Go the ahead. final breakdown on the stage, I think, is amazing. Uh, all the better for being done through a musical number as well. At the point at which I thought they'd abandoned the musical format, you know, when the sort of more serious stuff, dramatic stuff, begins to happen, um, as was you know that was my problem with, for instance, La La Land last year. Um, mm. That when this sort of non-comical stuff is happening. I mean, you know, dark things happen throughout the, the very underpinnings of the social milieu and everything that depicted is, I guess, serious. But when there's more sort of comical stuff happening, that's when the musical is being a musical. Whereas when sort of more serious stuff happens, it seems that the musicality is ditched. So I was pleased that her final breakdown happens in the form of a musical number. Um, because I, I don't see why characterization and story development can't happen through musical numbers. Yeah, um, sure. There shouldn't be intermi- yeah. Like intermissions. Yeah. Um, so I like that. I also liked um, Louise swooning over that dude Tulsa um, when he's singing and dancing in the alleyway about the, about his dream bride. Um, <sighs> you know what, haven't it? Louise looks lovely though. Like she's got pigtails. Um, she's got. She's wearing like the back half, I think, of a, a donkey suit. Um, so she's like in giant fucking donkey hooves. Um, she looks lovely. <laughs> so I was, I was kind of swooning over Louise, swooning over Tulsa. Um, at the at a point at which in the film where you where I still wasn't aware of the fact that she is the person who becomes Gypsy. Um, yeah. And that is quite a transformation. But yeah, early on, you see, you know, when they're all living together, when Mm. I think it's the first scene. In fact, it is the first scene when they're sort of adults, June and Louise, um, or not played by Elizabeth Moss uh, and her co-star. But it's um, it's Louise's surprise birthday. The landlord visits. uh, Herbie arrives with Mr. Goldstone from the Orpheum circuit. It's very, very exhausting and yes. then I and then I made a note. Is it enervating or exhilarating? Enervating. Okay, you've answered, the whole my, film is... you've answered my question. Is it Peter uh, Peter Rygard, By the way, we like <laughs> when, I, when I saw him, I was like, "What did I see him in recently?" He was the cop in the mask. Yep, and he's also the assemblyman uh, in Sopranos. In the Sopranos. Okay, but I mean in terms of oh what yeah, in recently, yeah, yeah, he was on. Yeah. He was covered in our last journeyman episode. He's so f- unintentionally funny as Herbie though, because he's like. You know when he shakes down the burlesque club owner, and it's like you know you're going to treat these women with respect and stuff. And the owner's mm. like, okay, and it's like he's the least imposing guy <laughs> ever. <Yeah. laughs> like very, very miscast, I think that role in particular. 
um, because he's not, you know, I don't really see Peter Riker as like a charming type. Um, no. Yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, I'm going to dish out another two here. Fuck, really? Jesus, man. It's it's hard to, like, I mean... It's a six. Come on, it's a six. Get real. <laughs> <laughs> a six. Yeah, wow. Like, Jesus. Yeah, I mean, again, it's just a personal preference thing, isn't it? Like, I'm a lot more forgiving of... Mu- In fact, I, I like musicals, you know? You don't. And I don't so... particularly. But, I mean, this is not a good musical, though, is it? I mean, even, no, it's even, not a good even, musical, no. Even setting aside the production, sure, sure, the yeah. specifics of the production, like, as a story, it's not very good. Like, yeah, you know, we're got, saying, like... It's the, got the, severe the, structural problems. Oh, yeah, maybe it's a five. But then if it's a five, it, makes it, it means it's his worst film, and I don't think it is. You take this over the Nutcracker? Yes. Okay, alright, well, what do you want to settle on? Oh, God, you're always pushing me to <sighs> settle on a fucking solid integer. Six. Okay, alright, so let's rank his films then. Give me your six to f- three. Okay, my number six is. See, I'm 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 actually having trouble because what Gypsy the, the benefit that that Gypsy has over the Nutcracker is that it doesn't have any forty minute ballet sequences in it, but the advantage that the Nutcracker has over Gypsy is that it's only eighty five minutes long. <laughs> That's true. Um, so I don't know. I'm trying to think like which one would I sit through again? That's what I've been asking myself when yeah, I've been ranking. I would. I'm going to put three. Gypsy at the bottom, two out of ten, and the Nutcracker two out of ten, at number five. Okay, and then let's see. Uh, then I've got number four. Chances are five out of ten. Number three, Dirty Dancing, six out of ten. Wow, okay. So my number six is The Nutcracker, six out of ten. Number five is Gypsy, six out of ten. Number four, Chances Are, six out of ten. And then my number three is Sister Act, seven out of ten. Okay. So my number two is... See, this is this is tricky for me as well because, like I said, Three Men and a Little Lady is a mixed bag. It's like the first half, meh. Second half is great. Whereas Sister Act is good all the way through. Sister Act's also the one that I've known longer, so like Three Men and a Baby feels a bit like a, a rediscovery for me. You three know, like I said, a, I had a little lady. Oh, sorry, Three Men and a Little Lady feels yeah. like a rediscovery. You know, where well, Three Men and a Baby I, I remember quite well, mm. uh, but like I said, I had entered a rating of three on IMDb, so. But I'm thinking again, I'm along the lines of like, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, number two is Sister Act, seven out of ten, and number one is Three Men and a Little Lady, seven out of ten. Yay! So my number two is Three Men and a Little Lady, eight out of ten, and my number one is Dirty Dancing, nine out of ten. Again, I have a wider distribution than you. You do. Seven to two. Nine You've to got six. Nine to six. Yep. Um, okay. <sighs> yeah, I can't bring myself to dislike movies. I just love them. Okay, so thank you for listening to episode 13 of The Journeyman. Please follow us on Twitter at underscore journeyman, and you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or TuneIn. My name is Bobby Lowe, and I've been here with... Michael Patterson. Uh, who, don't worry, won't be allowed to choose any more directors. Um <laughs> Okay, thank you and we will we will talk to you next time. Goodbye.